the wallflower's duty. Chapter 1 Dorset, 1802 Diana Oh yes, a ball, my dear Jane. It will be soon, very soon indeed. I do not doubt your sister has taken note of the event already. Lady Castleton smiled and looked toward Diana. You always watch over your sister, do you not, dear? I warrant you have her ball gown already made. Yes, indeed, my lady. Diana managed a smile at last. This afternoon, tea surrounded by ladies of society was claustrophobic for Diana, despite the large room. There were so many ladies, all dressed grandly in fine gowns, elegant headdresses, and with such jewels across their persons that everywhere she looked, she was blinded by the sunlight streaming through the window and reflecting in those jewels. We can go, Diana. Jane leaned toward her, bumping their shoulders together. Of course, sister, Diana said, softening her tone so no other but Jane could hear her at the table. I've ensured you have been invited to all the events this year in Dorset. You shall be quite the belle of each ball now you have had your debut. I do not doubt it. You are so kind to me. Jane giggled and reached for another cake from the tea table, smiling at the other ladies around her. She was confident, a natural in this environment, unlike Diana. It is the way I raised her to be. Diana admired her sister's countenance. She bore richly dark blonde hair that was curled exquisitely at the back of her head. Her features were petite to match the slim figure, and her cheeks were rosy with youth and happiness. As Jane was drawn into conversation around her with other ladies, Diana was content to sit back and watch her sister shine as if she were one of those many jewels that blinded others in the sunlight. She has grown into a fine young woman indeed. I could not be prouder of her. Oh yes, we must see you wed soon, Lady Castleton's sister Lady Warrington said and leaned toward Jane, patting her cheek sweetly. Such beauty will no doubt catch the eye of a man soon enough. Yes, one must move fast these days. There are so little suitors about. Lady Castleton sighed dramatically. Come, dears, have more tea. She topped up Diana's and Jane's teacups. Yes, indeed. And one would not wish to risk becoming a spinster, would they? Lady Warrington asked, chuckling and making her large cheeks wobble. Her sister elbowed her sharply, and the two looked straight at Diana. How awkward. Diana forced a smile to show she was completely comfortable with the situation, despite the fact the words had grated deep in her gut. She hurried to take a sip from her tea. At the age of 26, she was the spinster in town, sometimes much talked of for being such a spinster, and other times ignored like a flower in a vase that had been pushed to the corner of the room. I am happy to be so removed. I am here for Jane, and no other reason. Diana looked at Jane and felt warmth once again. She had raised her sister ever since their mother had passed ten years ago. Jane had just been eight at the time. Their father had provided for them, loved them, yes, but for guidance, softness, and a demonstration of how to be a lady. It was Diana's duty to show that for her sister. Since their father had also passed, their guardianship had passed into the hands of their uncle, the new Baron Cobham. Well, let's talk of what gentlemen you may meet, Miss Jane, Lady Castleton continued on quickly, trying to cover up the awkwardness in conversation. Do not tell her of that. Tell her of what help she can find, another lady called from somewhere across the table. With wildly curly red hair, she was a grand presence at the table. What you need to know, Miss Jane, is that when you are tossed in love, as regrettably every lady is, someone can help you. I have my sister for that, Jane said with confidence and reached toward Diana, laying a hand over hers. Diana smiled, showing she would always be there for her sister. Yes, but there is other help too, the red-haired lady Mrs Frogmore continued on. Have you not heard of Bonadea? Who is that? 
Diana asked, wrinkling her nose, certain she had heard the name somewhere before, though she could not sure. Some say she is a witch, Lady Warrington lowered her voice and whispered, as if it were a great scandal. Nonsense, her sister declared. Lady Castleton tapped her sister round the arm in reprimand, pushed her dark hair black behind her ear, and gave her full attention to Diana and Jane. Bonadea is a local healer, and has been much talked of recently as a lady who can help one who carries a wounded heart. Her help does not just come in tonics, Mrs Frogmore agreed with a firm nod. You mean her potions, Lady Warrington said from behind her teacup. Lady Castleton elbowed her so sharply that tea sloshed out the rim of her cup. Careful, dear. Diana and Jane struggled to hold back their laughter as they shared an amused look. She is no witch but a helper, Lady Castleton said firmly. Remember her name, Miss Jane, in case you are so unlucky as to be hurt by a suitor, though I pray it will never happen. Here, have some more cake. She offered Jane more cake, then suddenly remembered Diana was sat beside her and offered her cake too. Diana hid her amused smile behind her teacup. Thank you, I will, Jane said firmly. How does one talk to this Bonadea? Jane, Diana murmured in surprise. I am sure you will not need her. There is no harm in asking, I am sure. Jane returned her focus to the other ladies. How does one talk to her? There's an old oak tree at the edge of the village, on the river where it bends around a copse after the bridge, Mrs Frogmore explained, waving her cake fork in the air as she described her directions. There's a space in the tree where girls in the village leave her letters. You can leave one for her too. How curious, Diana whispered. One places a lot of faith in that no other will go and pick up the letters beyond Bonadea. She cast a glance at her sister, seeing that Jane was chewing her lip. Surely you do not need her services, sister. No, of course not. Jane smiled instantly, making her bright blue eyes light up. I was just wondering what sort of things this lady helps with. She stared so intently that Diana began to shift in her seat, self-consciously sipping more of her tea. Is Jane up to something? I can always tell when she's hard at thought. Jane chewed on her lip, telling Diana that something was indeed afoot. Anyway, tell us more of this ball, Lady Castleton, Diana said, eager to move the subject on. Will there be many suitors for my sister? Oh, I am sure there will be. Fear not, I will make it my endeavour to introduce you to every suitable gentleman I know. Lady Castleton laid a hand to her chest, sitting taller. I will see you dancing with every fair-faced man that comes. What of my sister? Jane asked. Do you know of any suitable suitors for her? Diana nearly choked on her tea and managed to cough into her teacup. Under the cover of the table, she stepped on her sister's toe, trying to stop her from talking. I am a spinster. She knows that. Diana had learned long ago not to think of her own heart. For so long her focus had been Jane, and it still was that it was the way she lived her life. Every morning she rose from bed and thought of Jane, how to make her happy, and give her a good day. When she thought of suitors, she only ever thought of what man would suit Jane. The ladies around the table looked at Diana, a strange quietness descending between them. Well, Lady Warrington struggled and pulled at the string of pearls around her throat. I am sure we could find a gentleman. Fear not, Diana spoke quickly, recognising the worried expression in all the ladies' faces. Diana was no beauty, like her sister was, and the great dowry was also being saved for Jane. Diana was a poor prospect for any man, especially as she had been declared a spinster for so long. It made her gut tighten to speak in such a way, but she knew it was the truth. I am not intending to dance that night. I only wish for my sister to enjoy herself at the ball. Pray, devote your attention to her dance partners. As you wish, Miss Shorb. 
What a loving sister you are, Lady Castleton said, and tapped Diana's hand that rested on the table in a comforting touch. Chapter Two Jane There, that should do it. Jane sat back from her writing bureau and looked over the letter she had written to Bonadea. It was a heartfelt letter, one written in a rush, for she feared Diana would come in at any moment and discover her plot. But it was a good letter all the same. Glancing to the door, she ensured Diana was not nearby in the house before she reread her letter. Dear Bonadea, I have heard from the local ladies that you are a helper, a woman who can help not just in terms of a lady's health but for her happiness. I write to you not for myself but for my sister, Miss Diana Schaub. I love my sister dearly. She has been a second mother to me since the passing of our own mother, and we have always been happy together, but this last year or so things have changed. My sister suffers from a melancholy. I've never heard her accept it. Not in so many words, but I often catch her in these moments of sadness, staring into the fire and not bothering with a fire screen, so she ends up with a reddened face, or maybe even staring at her books without turning the pages for so long, that it shows she is lost in her thoughts. I long to see my sister happy. For so many years she has devoted herself to my own happiness, but now I have had my debut and hope to attend many events in Dorset. I do not wish for my sister to stand at my shoulder forever. I long for her to have a life of her own, but I fear this melancholy holds her back. Pray, write back when you can. I would be thankful for your thoughts on how one can beat such sadness. Yours, etc., Miss Jane Shawb. Jane! Are you there? Diana's voice called across the house. One minute! Jane called back and folded the letter hurriedly, stuffing it into a hidden pocket in her empire-lined gown to hide it from her sister. She cannot know of it. Diana would certainly never write such a letter. Diana was always one for keeping her own troubles close to her chest. Often, she would not even open up to Jane, and such secrets had to be prized from her, like blood from a stone. There you are. Diana appeared in the doorway and Jane stood turning toward her sister. Diana's blonde hair was swept away at the back of her head. The bluish-grey eyes stared at Jane keenly, with a curiosity in that gaze. You are staying mysteriously secret this morning. Oh, I am quite well, just longing for a walk. I might take a turn in the gardens. Jane reached for a bonnet she had tossed on a nearby chair and pulled it over her head. I will come with you. No. Jane spoke so quickly that Diana stopped dead in the room and folded her arms, her lean figure stilling. You sound harsh, sister, Diana said with a small smile that quickly faltered. Is all well? Yes, of course. Jane offered an easy smile as she tied the bow of her bonnet. I merely wish to listen to the birds this morning. I will walk in the garden, but I promise not to wander any further. Well, if you wish it. Diana nodded, though she glanced at the door in the sitting room that led out to the gardens, a little nervousness in her manner. I can walk alone, Diana, Jane giggled, as Diana smiled too. I know, forgive me. Diana sighed. I sometimes forget how grown you are. I shall check on our uncle and his work. Enjoy your walk. Thank you. Jane waited until her sister had left the room, then exhaled sharply in relief. I pray you help my endeavour, God. She sent a quick prayer to the heavens, looking up to the ceiling as she wrapped a shawl around her shoulders and left the house. The sun was hot, bearing down on her skin and making a warmth spread through her. The shawl slipped a little from her shoulders and in the heat she didn't bother to rearrange it. She just walked quickly away from the gardens and slipped out of the gate and onto the drive, being careful to glance back at the house and ensure that no one had seen her from any of the windows. Her uncle's home, Baron Cobham's manor, stood 
grandly on the lawn. The grey stone structure was stout and not too broad, topped with shining grey slate and so many turreted chimneys that an attempt to count them was a confusing task. The arched windows shined in the sunlight, and around the front door, ivy grew. It was a picturesque house indeed. Jane had often heard Diana say she could live in this house forever, but as their uncle had reminded them once, that would not be possible. Some day when he passed, this estate would be entailed away to some distant cousin. If Diana does not marry, what will happen to her then? Jane wrapped the shawl tighter around her shoulders and walked on, her worries for her sister driving her to walk faster. She hurried quickly to Wareham Village and out toward the river. Casting quick looks over her shoulders, she ensured no one was around before she rushed along the river past the bridge and stepped between a small copse of trees. Which tree is it? Jane muttered, reaching for the letter in her pocket and running her fingers over the paper. Eventually her eyes landed on an old oak tree with fresh acorns growing between the leaves. That one! Hurrying forward, she dropped the letter into a notch hidden in the tree. Please, God, she sent another prayer. May this woman be able to help my sister. Stepping back, Jane smiled broadly. At least now. Maybe a new path could begin for her sister, something that would make her smile fully at last. Jane hurried away from the river. She was so distracted with hope that she barely looked where she trained her feet. More than once did she nearly step in manure left by passing horses in the village and ended up almost bumping into young maids in the street. She called out an apology and ran on, with the heat growing stronger by the minute. Pulling at her shawl and the sleeves of her gown, she found the heat was insufferable. Breathing heavily, she shifted the gown and stared ahead, realising that she had wandered from her path a great distance. She was no longer walking through the main streets of the village, but a much quieter area. Here there were just one or two houses, yet what filled Jane with fear was a group of young men that looked toward her. They had been gambling, sat outside an inn, all bending over tankards of ale that rested on round mahogany tables. Drunken faces angled toward her, some with ale dripping down their chins. I have walked the wrong way home. Jane backed up, all too aware of how their eyes fixed on her. Some sport, eh? One man said to another with a deep chuckle. Laughter followed, and two men stood, walking toward her. One could not walk straight but practically plated his own legs as he headed in her direction. The other walked with purpose. Jane backed up further, no longer looking where she was going, as her breathing became faster in fear. Do you need company, ma'am? The man who walked with purpose asked. I'm sure I could give you good company for the night. Jane turned, ready to run away, when her foot slipped on the hem of her gown. She fell over, landing with her hands in the dirt. Hey, look, she's laying down for you already. Must be eager for some company after all, one of the men drawled, coming so close to Jane that she froze on the earth, petrified. The second man stepped over her, his lips drooling with spittle as he leered at her. She hurried to push the skirt of her gown down, worried how much of her legs were on show. Don't cover up now, miss, he bent toward her. Jane leaned back, her heart pounding in her ears. Stand aside, a voice called loudly. The men backed up as Jane lifted her head, wondering who had called. A carriage had pulled up and a head was thrust through the open door. Jane scrambled to her feet as the door flicked open and a set of dark eyes stared out from the doorway. A tall man with dashing clothes and long black hair that curled around his ears stepped down. He had evidently seen what was happening for he walked straight past Jane and delivered a glower at the approaching men. Return to your drinking, the stranger ordered, his voice incredibly deep. The two drunks hesitated for a second. One sighed deeply, and the other cursed under his breath. Rich men, always coming to spoil the sport, 
he muttered. Could have had some fun with her. She is a lady, not a game of skittles, the stranger snapped. When he stepped forward threateningly, the two drunkards ran away, heading back to their table. Jane caught her breath, panting as she leaned against the carriage beside her. As the man turned back to face her, she appraised his person. He was older than her, perhaps in his mid-thirties, or even a little older than that. His square jaw and wide forehead were handsome, if in a rather unorthodox way. He stepped toward her, yet kept his distance and didn't come too close. Forgive my interruption, I feared what I had discovered. He glanced back at the drunkards who had now lost interest. Pray tell, ma'am, are you well? Chapter 3 Arnold I am quite well, thank you, the young woman said, though she still leaned on the wall of Arnold's carriage. She's not completely well. Arnold had seen enough evil behaviour during his time on the continent to fear what sport the drunkards had in mind. He glanced toward the men once again, finding a few had retreated inside the inn out of fear of further trouble. Arnold stepped to the lady's side, worried for her. Forgive me my impertinence, but this is a quiet area for a lady to walk alone, he murmured, wondering if he had met her before. He had grown up in this part of Dorset, yet the years of work on the continent had left him out of touch with the faces back home. He presumed he might have met her once, long ago, but he would have been a young man then and she may have just been a baby at the time, for she was very young indeed. I know. The lady giggled and shook her head. You must think me a great fool indeed. Not a fool, but... Arnold was usually a man for speaking plainly, but he kept himself in check at this moment. Naive, perhaps. Let us not talk of that. Let us get you somewhere safe instead, away from here. He nodded his head at the inn, then shifted his dark jacket across his body and gestured to the carriage. I'm well aware offering a place in a carriage to a young lady may not be appropriate, but it's infinitely preferable to leaving you here. I quite agree. She sighed and released the carriage wall, walking shakily to the door. I will drop you home. Where is it you live? he asked, offering his hand to help her up. She took it and stepped up into the carriage. He thought he saw a flicker of fear in her eyes despite her confident manner. The brush with the drunkards had hardly left her unaffected. Do you know Baron Cobham's estate? Kingston Manor, she said softly. That is where I live. I have heard of it. Arnold knew he had never visited the house, but had often ridden past the driveway long ago when he was young. I shall return you to the house forthwith. He gave the directions to his driver, then stepped up into the carriage, being careful to sit on the far side of the coach and keep as much distance as possible between him and the young lady. May I know your name, ma'am? Miss Jane Schaub, I am Baron Cobham's niece. She abruptly laughed and covered her face with her shawl, turning red. There was charm to her countenance if one that was a little young and immature. I wish you to know. I am not so great a fool as to always go walking by myself in lonely places. It is unusual for me to go anywhere alone, but I thought it necessary today. If I may ask, why is that? Arnold asked, waiting for her to go on. She lowered her shawl sighed and sat back on the bench with an easy smile on her face. I was seeking the advice of a stranger for my sister. She rolled her eyes. My sister would certainly never seek such advice herself, though she surely needs it. Arnold held back a laugh, rather thinking that Miss Jane Sharp had a tendency to share too much with strangers. She hadn't yet asked his name, and yet was telling him personal things about her sister. What is your sister's name? Arnold asked. Diana. Miss Jane smiled, 
like the Roman goddess? Just so, Miss Jane nodded. Arnold found images of Italy returning to his mind. In his diplomatic work, he'd spent much time in the country and had admired the great marble statues of all the deities, including Diana. Not one statue of Diana had ever been a poor one. Far from it, they were statues of beauty and grace. She will be worried about you, surely, Arnold said gesturing toward Miss Jane, who grimaced. Oh, no, when she hears of this, she certainly will be. She hid her face in embarrassment once again. My sister has always cared for me. She's sweet like that, loving, and what do I do? In my first attempt to do something for her, I end up in trouble. Well, we avoided the trouble today, Arnold assured her with a wave of his hand. You are eager to help your sister, I see. Very eager, Miss Jane said, lowering her hands and sitting tall. She is my sister, and there is no greater woman in this world. I suppose I am biased to say such a thing. She giggled. Yet I speak the truth. I'm sure you do. Well, let us put your sister's mind at rest and return you home. He leaned forward and looked out of the window, rather curious to be back home again in Dorset. He longed to see how it had changed and admired the glimpses of flowers that whipped past the window. Forgive me, but I do not know your face, sir. I have had my debut, yet I am sure you were not at the ball. I have a good memory for faces, and am certain I would remember you, Miss Jane said, plainly an eager talker. That is because I have been travelling the continent. I have just returned home. His eyes danced across the scenery. The hot summer was making the green trees and lush grass dazzle in the light. Wild poppies and daffodils danced in the undergrowth as the carriage whipped by, hurrying to its destination. You travel alone? Miss Jane asked. Yes, always. Arnold kept this thought to himself. These days, loneliness crept in. When he was younger, he'd always assured himself that someday he would marry and he would no longer suffer that loneliness. But as the years had passed, he began to fear that maybe he would be a bachelor forever. No lady had ever inspired true admiration or devotion in him. The only time a mother or a daughter had set their cap at him was when they discovered his status. It had little to do with the man he was. Now... That loneliness feels worse than ever. He sat back, buttoning his tailcoat and keeping distance between himself and Miss Jane. If anyone learned of the two of them sharing a carriage alone, it would be most inappropriate, yet he was genuinely trying to help. Ah, here we are, Miss Jane declared and leaned forward as Baron Cobham's house came into view. Arnold's eyes flicked toward the grey stone house of Kingston Manor. It was a beautiful building, if not overly grand or large, but perfectly proportioned. A fine building. As the carriage came to a stop, Arnold stepped down first and offered his hand to Miss Jane. She took it gladly and stepped out. Thank you, thank you so much, she said hurriedly, releasing his hand. Had you not arrived when you did, sir, I fear, well, let us not talk of it. Yes, that is probably wise, he nodded. You may rest assured that no harm came to you today, and I pray, in future, Miss Jane, you will not walk alone in such parts of town. You are right. She smiled and waved a hand at her own foolishness. It seems my heart was in the right place for my sister, but I neglected to take any wisdom with me. She chuckled and turned to face the door. Oh, Diana! Her footsteps failed her, and she fell still. Arnold turned round to see this much talked of sister. His body stilled as his eyes settled on the slender figure standing in the doorway. She was striking. Her blue-grey eyes stared at Arnold with equal shock. Her blonde hair was a mixture of light and dark tones, tied at the back of her head with a few tempting curls lingering down by her thin neck. Her skin was alabaster white, her face narrow and her lips full. 
She slowly stepped down the front steps that led to the house, moving toward her sister and Arnold. Her eyes seemed to be as much on him as he struggled to tear his gaze away from her. She curtsied, and Arnold remembered his manners, hurrying to bow too, though the whole time he could not take his eyes off her. When did I stop being such a gentleman? His thoughts wandered, tempted not just by the lady's beauty, but by the keenness of that gaze. Sister, she spoke softly, her voice a little husky. Pray introduce us. Who is this? Oh, I neglected to ask his name. Miss Diana Schaub looked sharply at her sister and back at Arnold. My name is Arnold Bowen, Baron Lexington. Chapter Four Diana. Well, I... Diana struggled for words, uncertain what to think or feel. Jane had been gone so long. Up until a few minutes ago, Diana had been pacing the rooms of the house restlessly. Their uncle had left the house on business about an hour ago, so she was left to worry alone about what had happened to Jane. Am I relieved or furious? Her eyes flicked to Jane seeing her sister's face redden as she hung her head forward. Then she looked to the stranger again. Lord Lexington. His name seemed to burn a place in his mind. He was older than her, maybe even by ten years or so, yet she responded to him in a way she had not responded to any other man before. I suppose this is what they call attraction. She felt heated, and it had little to do with the sun. It had much more to do with the dark hair, the square jaw, and the expressive dark eyes that were large in his features. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Thank you again. Now back to our story. He was tall as he stepped toward her, making her feel quite short despite the fact she was not as petite as Jane. I should explain, Lord Lexington said in a rush. I came across your sister in the village. She was not comfortable with the situation she was in. Comfortable? Diana whipped her head round, looking at Jane, who had reddened now to the colour of a tomato. What happened, Jane? I decided to walk beyond the garden walls, that was all, she said in a rush. You walked all the way to the village? Yes. Jane said in a small voice. I was enjoying my walk until... What happened? Diana panicked and stepped toward her sister. She seemed well despite the heat in her cheeks. She bore no cuts, no bruises, and held her shawl tightly around her shoulders. Some drunkards made comments, Miss Shawb. That is all. Lord Lexington followed her, coming to her side. I happened to be coming past in my carriage when I saw your sister's discomfort and offered her a ride home. Then we are indebted to you greatly. I thank you. Diana dropped another curtsy, so thankful to Lord Lexington that she told herself that was why she could not stop staring at him, and that it had little to do with the way just staring at him made her feel heated. Jane, you know you are not supposed to go beyond the estate alone. She at last managed to look away from him. Yes, but it is not always an easy rule to abide by. Jane sighed deeply and walked back toward the house. Diana felt a tightening in her gut. Her hands balled into fists as she watched Jane retreat to the house, but she did not follow her sister, not wishing to part from Lord Lexington's side. There was no real danger, Lord Lexington dropped his voice when Jane was far enough away. The closeness of his voice brought an intimacy to the moment that had Diana fidgeting, her hands ringing together in front of her. There was not, she asked in fear. I think the men intended to make comments only. One can never be certain in that regard, Diana added tightly. Perhaps not, Lord Lexington sighed. Yet, I have seen enough in my travels to know when one is safe and truly in danger. Your sister was in a village in daylight. She was quite safe, I assure you. Your travels? You are not a local then, Lord Lexington? 
Diana felt her gut tighten, fearing this might be the one and only time she would see these handsome features. Oh, I am. I have returned today from my travels to Europe. I am a diplomat and have been there these last twelve years on business, he explained in a rush. Twelve years? Goodness, that's a long time to be away from home, she whispered in awe. You must have seen much of Europe in your time. Yes, indeed, he nodded, Italy mostly. What adventures you must have had. Diana smiled, forgetting herself as she thought of Lord Lexington and his journeys to Europe. Forgive me, I am getting off topic. Not at all, he shook his head with a smile. It struck Diana that he seemed to be staring at her as much as she was him. What does this mean? Is he perturbed that I would let my sister wander alone? He certainly does not look unhappy. On the contrary, his thin lips kept turning up in a persistent smile. We are indebted to you, my lord, both my sister and I. She spoke quickly and gestured toward her sister to see that Jane had retreated to the doorway and was leaning on the frame with a humoured smile on her features. As you say, maybe there was no real harm, but one cannot be certain. She wrung her hands tighter, turning her focus back to Lord Lexington as she lowered her voice further. Truly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Her words made his smile grow wider. You are devoted to your sister, Miss Schaub, his voice deepened, as any good sister should be. You make me quite envious, he said, shifting his weight between his feet. He pulled at his collar, clearly suffering in the heat. Diana found herself mirroring his action, pulling at the shoulder of her gown a little. I have never had a sibling. To feel that devotion, it must be something special indeed. Yes, my lord, it is. Diana smiled, feeling a strange comfortableness in speaking to this gentleman. My sister and I are each other's world. I see myself as her protector. Like the Roman goddess. Lord Lexington's words startled her and she blinked at him. Forgive me. He laughed at her reaction. When I travelled in Italy, I learned much of the Roman deities. When your sister told me of your name, I pictured those great marble statues of Diana, the Roman goddess. She is always a protector, usually presented with majesty, with a bow and arrows too. Then I'm afraid my skill would disappoint you. When I shoot arrows, I tend to miss the target altogether. Her words prompted him to chuckle deeply. What is happening? Diana had quite forgotten herself. She was standing on this driveway, talking to this stranger as if they were old friends. Meanwhile, Jane hovered in the doorway to the house, watching them as though they were on some fine theatre stage. As the Baron's laughter faded, Diana found herself staring at him, falling completely still. Her lips parted and closed as she sought something to say. But she was a quiet soul. She did not find chatter as easily as Jane did, and in that moment, what skill she had failed her. Say something, you fool. Lord Lexington does us a great turn today, does he not, sister? Jane called from the doorway. Her sister rescued Diana and made her jump, quite having forgotten Jane was there. Lord Lexington flinched too, with his eyes torn away from Diana. Yes, indeed he does. Diana raised her voice so her sister could hear her. Yet you should not have put him in danger either, Jane. All it takes is one drunkard who is overconfident, or two in his cups for such situations to become dreadful. Sister, Jane protested loudly. Forgive me, Jane, but I speak the truth. It is my responsibility to protect you. The protector, Lord Lexington whispered beside her. I have a feeling you have no need of a bow and arrow, Miss Shorb. She smiled at his words, looking back at him. Perhaps we should show our gratitude toward Lord Lexington in another way? Jane called, stepping off the front step again. What do you say? Yes, I... Words failed Diana as she racked her brains of what to offer. 
She would like to do something for Lord Lexington, but what would he accept? I need no gift of thanks, he said in a rush. I was simply glad to be of service. He added another bow to Diana. The whole time he held her gaze in such a way that she was quite breathless by the time he stood straight again. There's an intensity in that gaze. Perhaps you could come for dinner tomorrow evening, my lord, Jane offered. Jane, Diana hissed and turned round. Such invitations should be issued by their uncle, if at all, not by themselves, for it was not the done thing. Yet Jane's confidence was an easy one, and she smiled sweetly as she crossed back toward Diana and Lord Lexington. Would you come, my lord? I know we shall have to ask our uncle to complete the formalities, but I am sure we would both be glad of your company, of a chance to say thank you. I'm sure my sister would be glad of your presence. Jane elbowed Diana. Subtly, Diana stood on Jane's foot to make her stop talking. To her relief, Lord Lexington didn't seem to notice. I am sure he will say no. Diana felt what a fool she had been, standing here staring at him so openly. He probably thought her a simpleton, a foolish woman. For what reason would he wish to come back to share dinner with her? I would be glad to come. Lord Lexington's answer made Diana's jaw drop. She only closed her mouth again as Jane returned her earlier favour and stepped on her toe. Then you are most welcome here, my lord. Diana said in a rush, remembering her manners. Shall we say tomorrow evening at six o'clock? I look forward to it. He bowed to the two of them, though his eyes appeared to linger a little longer on Diana. Perhaps it was just in my imagination. She brushed off the thought and watched the gentleman as he gave instructions to his driver, then climbed back into the carriage. As the coach rode away, he nodded once at them through the window, then parted, his handsome face slipping from view. Diana stared down the driveway at the retreating carriage, uncertain why her heart was thudding so hard in her chest, or why her palms were clammy. It's hot, isn't it? Diana whispered, still staring at the carriage as it turned at the end of the drive. Is that because of the weather, or the handsome Lord Lexington? Jane, Diana hissed in reprimand, turning to face her sister. You should not speak so. Oh, why ever not? She asked with a shrug and linked her arm with Diana's. You stared so openly at him. He surely can be in little doubt that you admire his features. Do not speak so, I pray you. Diana raised her free hand and covered her face, fearing it was true. I hope you are wrong, and he simply thought me foolish to stare so much. Ha, ah, he would have to be a fool himself not to notice the true reason. Your face is bright red. No, surely it is not. Yet the heat in Diana's cheeks told her it was the truth. As they stopped on the doorstep, Diana turned to face her sister. I know what you are doing. You are merely being mischievous to distract me from discussing what has really happened today. You put yourself in danger, Jane. Do you expect me to forget that? Jane's smile faltered and her cheek twitched with the movement. I... I simply went for a walk, she whispered. A walk? You wandered so far just for a walk? Diana shook her head, quite baffled by her sister's behaviour. You know it is not safe to wander so far alone. What if you had been robbed? You may have been in your fine gown. I was perfectly safe, Jane insisted, and glanced back through the door. Maybe I achieved in my walk what I wished to find after all. What do you mean? What was it you wished to find? Yet Jane did not answer. She raised her eyebrows with a playful smile and walked into the house, leaving Diana to follow behind her, asking relentless questions that were never answered. Chapter 5 Arnold 
Lord Lexington, we are so delighted to see you again. Miss Jane greeted him boldly, hurrying down the stairs. Arnold passed his frock coat to a butler, thanking him kindly for his help, before he turned to greet the ladies. Baron Cobham was not with them, and they approached him alone. Miss Jane led the way, and behind her on the stairs walked Miss Shawb. She was striking, her rather melancholic figure regal as she approached him much slower. She is mysterious. I cannot help watching her. Good evening to you, Miss Jane. He moved his gaze away with some difficulty and bowed to Miss Jane, who curtsied in a hurry. I trust you are well after yesterday. Very well, thank you. You are a good friend to me already, my lord, I see that. She continued to smile and glanced back to her sister. Is he not a friend already, sister? He is kind indeed. Miss Shobe widened her eyes momentarily at Miss Jane, clearly silently warning her to not be so forward. Yet Arnold did not mind. It was rather refreshing after so many years of stiff and formal meetings as a diplomat to have someone be so informal with him. Miss Sharb. He bowed to her in greeting, his eyes lingering on hers. She curtsied, her lips flickering into a smile. Momentarily, the sadness that clung to her figure seemed to evaporate. How are you this evening? I am... well, thank you. Have you recovered from your long journey home? You did not say where on the continent you were, but it must have been some journey. She looked curious as she approached. It was. The sea can be an unfriendly woman, choppy and restless, he explained, as Miss Jane led the way through the hall toward the dining room. Miss Shaw walked at Arnold's side as he told her of his trip across the ocean. I confess, though I have of course seen the sea living in Dorset, I have never once been on a boat, Miss Shorb said as they entered the dining room. Never, he said in surprise. Then I am happy to answer any questions you might have about it. Thank you. Here, take a seat, my lord. She gestured toward a chair and he hurriedly sat, pleased to see that she took the chair opposite him so he could look her in the eye. The candles that stood tall in their brass holders between them flickered as if a breeze passed through the room. Miss Jane sat beside her sister, and at the head of the table there was an empty seat. "'Your uncle will not be joining us then?' he asked, glancing at that chair. "'He is busy with business at present, though I told him of your visit,' Miss Shaw answered him. "'He is most eager to meet you and thank you for your help to my sister.' Miss Jane rolled her eyes in response. "'I was in no great danger,' she insisted though a dark look from her sister silenced her on the subject. Then something strange happened in their conversation. As dinner was served and Arnold busied himself with the food, Miss Shaw grew quiet. Instead, Miss Jane was the one at ease in conversation. Her elder sister encouraged her to speak, but said little to Arnold himself. Over the years, Arnold had handled himself easily at such dinners and events. As a diplomat, it had been necessary to be at ease in company and attempt some charm, yet never had he known this anxiousness that overtook him now. Not even when I attended a dinner with the Prince Regent was I as nervous as this. He pulled at the midnight blue cravat at his neck, loosening the tie as he looked at Miss Shawb. She was quiet and said nothing as her sister continued on. We have been mentioning your name to our friends today, my lord, Miss Jane said. They were eager to hear of you now, for it has been so long since you have been in the county. I don't doubt they were eager for gossip, he said playfully, noting that Miss Schaub smiled at his words and looked up from her wine glass, their gazes connecting across the table. Oh yes, they were. Fear not. We told them nothing, for of course we know little of you yet. You must tell us of your travels, my lord, Miss Jane spoke with excitement. Diana said you mentioned Italy yesterday. Have you been there much? A lot indeed. It is a wondrous place. Everywhere you turn there is a fine view, whether that's the natural beauty of the rolling Tuscan hills or the culture and architecture you find in the cities of Florence and Naples. 
There are so many marble statues, I'm afraid I mistook one for a person at the periphery of my vision more than once. He was glad to see he could make Miss Shaub smile again. I wish she would speak with ease to me. Yet there was a nervousness in her countenance too. He recognised it now as she reached for the wine jug, her fingers trembling. When she nearly toppled it over, he smiled and took the jug for her, topping up her glass. Thank you, she whispered softly. I wish you to know, my lord, my sister was not gossiping of you today. It is just the likes of Lady Castleton and Lady Warrington are eager for what news they can have. I see the look in your eye, Miss Schaub, Arnold said, smiling. You no doubt know as well, as I that people in these parts love to gossip. I don't doubt my name was said with relish, as if they consumed some fine jam tart as they said my name. She laughed softly. I fear they may have done, she whispered. Fear not. I can provide them with little gossip, for I have no great scandal to my name. Those are the tales whispered with alacrity and delight, are they not? he asked. He'd seen repeatedly over the years how gossip could destroy not only one's good name, but someone's happiness too. Something in Miss Sharp's manner faltered. That smile was no longer in place as she sipped her wine. Yes, indeed. She nodded. She's sad because people whisper of her, Jane confessed, leaning forward conspiratorially. Jane! Miss Shaub spun round in her chair with her whisper sharp. We do not speak of such things openly. Yet Lord Lexington is a friend now, is he not? Miss Jane's insistence made her sister blush, such a deep shade of red. The heat in her cheeks had to be uncomfortable. She fidgeted restlessly, picking up her wine glass, putting it down again, and leaning forward to hide her face from Arnold. Ah, Miss Shaub, you need not fear me. He wanted more than anything to wash the embarrassment away for her. They speak of her because she is an older sister and unmarried, Miss Jane said with a shrug. Such hurtful things people can say. Then they must speak of every gentleman in the county with relish. I warrant there are many more here older than you, Miss Shaub, who are not yet wed. I'm one of them too, am I not? He sought to make her more comfortable and she looked up from her wine. If they talk of you, then when they meet me again, they shall have a field day. He chuckled and she smiled softly, that stiff countenance relenting. A door closed somewhere in the recesses of the house. Ah! That must be our uncle returning home. I will go to greet him. Miss Jane moved to her feet. Sister! Miss Sharp tried to keep her sister with her, but Miss Jane was too quick. I shall be back momentarily. Arnold held himself still, as did Miss Shaub, after turning to look at him in her high-backed chair. They were not alone, for the butler and one server stood in the room by the open door, but it was enough for Arnold to be extremely aware of every movement Miss Sharp made and the nervousness in his own countenance. Forgive my sister for her outspokenness, Miss Shaub said, avoiding his gaze as she looked down at her plate. She is confident something I love her for, but she is often too familiar. I quite admire it. His words made her snap her attention back to his face. He leaned forward across the table, inching a little closer to her. I have spent years in dull diplomatic meetings. They are boring and full of stiff reserve. To talk so freely is refreshing indeed. I hope you will feel such freedom with me some day, he added in a low whisper hoping that Miss Sharp would see how much he wished to be her friend, or something more. An image struck up in his mind, where he sat at this table not as the guest, but as a suitor to Miss Sharp. Such excitement filled his body at the thought that his leg bounced under the table. You are kindness itself, my lord, she whispered, as if afraid to say the words. I... She was about to say something more, but broke off. Her cheeks heated. What is it you wish to say? he asked, encouraging her on. They stared at one another across the table, 
that intensity passing between them again. Does she feel this sensation? Was it possible he was the only one with a quickened heartbeat? The only one whose body was so heated? Uncle, here he is. Miss Jane's voice at the doorway made them snap their gazes away from one another. Arnold shifted his focus to see Miss Jane in the doorway alongside her uncle, Baron Cobham. He was an older man, portly, with heavy crow's feet around his grey eyes and his light fair hair that was beginning to turn white. He stepped forward with a broad smile in greeting. Lord Lexington, he bowed deeply as Arnold stood. It is my pleasure to meet you. Jane has, of course, spoken much of your service to her yesterday. I am indebted deeply, sir, indebted indeed. It was no trouble. I... Well, I see they are feeing you well. More wine, my lord? Yes, more wine, Simpkins, he called to the butler. Arnold held back his laugh, seeing that Lord Cobham did not interrupt him out of rudeness, but out of eagerness to speak. It seemed that his niece, Miss Jane, was a little like him in their liking for conversation. Miss Diana Schaub is different. As Lord Cobham spoke of how happy he was to meet Arnold again, summoned wine, port and brandy, just in case one of them was not his tipple, Arnold's focus shifted to Miss Schaub. She was enigmatic in her quietness, and the sadness had returned to her manner. It was a mystery as to why she was so sad in such a happy household as this. Surprisingly, it only made Arnold more intrigued by her. He wished to know her thoughts as she raised her wine glass to her lips and what she felt in her heart as she looked at him, that stuttered breath escaping past her full lips. There must be more on your mind, Miss Sharp. something more you would like to say if you felt the freedom to do so. I wish I knew what it was. Chapter 6 Diana, you are staring at your book again but not reading it. Jane's words captivated Diana. Slowly, she put down the book, resting it in her lap. She and Jane were sitting in the garden, in the shade under an old oak tree, with its long branches curling down around them, cocooning them. The table between them was scattered with cakes, and their teacups rested on the edge. Jane was working on her embroidery with fine skills, and Diana was distracted as she had attempted to read one of her favourite stories. What is it that you dwell so much on in your mind? Jane asked. You speak little of what bothers you these days. It does not matter. Diana did not wish to discuss what plagued her mind, for it had bothered her all night and left her equally restlessly during the day. Intermittently she yawned, fighting the tiredness that swept into thanks to her sleepless night. After Lord Lexington had parted the night before, she had been unable to stop thinking of him. As she had laid her head down to go to sleep, she replayed almost every moment of the evening in her mind. I am officially going mad. Perhaps I drank too much wine, and that is why I thought of him so much. Despite her thoughts in her heart, she knew it was not true for she thought of him now in the light of the day, when she had only been drinking tea. She dwelled on Baron Lexington's smile, the way those dark eyes had gazed at her, and lastly, how he had spoken with her when they were quite alone in the dining room together. There had been an intimacy there she longed to have again. Oh, why will you not share things? Jane said harshly, and tossed her embroidery down on the table. Goodness, Jane, what's wrong? Diana asked, looking with worry toward her sister. Why do you keep such secrets? Jane stood and waved an arm at Diana. All I ask is to know what is going on in your mind. I seek to protect you from worries, that is all. It's an act of love, Jane. Her words made her sister huff and turn away, marching up and down in the shade from the oak tree. Though if you wish to talk of secrets between us, then let me ask you something. Why did you really stray from this garden two days ago? Jane halted her pacing and looked toward Diana. After a beat, Diana raised a solitary eyebrow, showing she was still waiting for an answer. 
I... I went for a walk. I once heard you declare, there were enough walks in this estate to satisfy a lady for life, Diana reminded her. So there must be another reason. There is not, Jane insisted, her voice so petulant that she looked quite young again. I have known since you were eight what you do when you lie. Diana rolled her eyes. Your voice rises an octave and you take on this petulant tone. I do not. Jane folded her arms, but as she heard her own tone, she laughed, bending forward. Perhaps I do sound like that a little. Just so. Diana placed her book down on the table beside her. You wish for no secrets, then tell me yours. Why did you leave the garden? You will not like it, Jane muttered, steepling her hands together in her old nervous habit. I do not like that you got into trouble and had to be rescued by the gallant Lord Lexington, so you risk no further disapproval. Diana shrugged and sat back in her chair. Pray, go on. I... Jane stepped forward and lowered her hands to her side, sighing deeply. I wish to deliver a letter to Bonadea. Bonadea? Wait. Diana hesitated, thinking of when she had last heard the name. The healer. You wish to write to the healer? She leapt to her feet. Sister, what is wrong? Are you ill? Are you suffering some sickness I do not know about? She placed a hand to her sister's temple, checking for a temperature. Ha! Huh. Your first thought is always for me, is it not? You never once think of you, Jane pointed out, pushing Diana's hand away from her head. You are avoiding answering. Diana placed her hands on her hips. Because I am perfectly well. Jane mimicked her stance. I wrote to Bonadea for you. For me? Whatever for, Diana spluttered. I am perfectly well. No. You are not. The strong tone of Jane wrong-footed Diana, and she stepped back. You carry a sadness on your shoulders. It has been the same this last year. Can you say you have not noticed it? I am not sad. I am simply becoming quieter. Diana hurried to sit again and pulled her book forward, resting it in her lap. I know I'm sad. Diana would not confess the truth to her sister, fearing it would cause Jane worries she did not need to have. The truth was that this last year, Diana had come to realise that soon enough, Jane would leave this house. She would marry and make a life of her own. It was Diana's dearest wish to see her sister settled, happy and married. But what would become of Diana then? In her lonesome moments, Fears crept in like they were ghosts that haunted her thoughts. I will be left in this house alone. Then some day our uncle will pass, the house will be gone, and what will become of me then? The sadness was the fear of loneliness. I am quite well, Diana said aloud. Yes, and I am a bumblebee. I beg your pardon, Diana said sharply, just as Jane laughed loudly. Forgive me, I thought we were declaring stuff that was false. She took her seat, moved it in front of Diana and sat down again. I was writing a letter for you and asked for Bonadea's advice regarding melancholy. I did not wish you to know, for I feared you would not let me send it. I am sorry, but I did it for the right reasons. You have a good heart. Diana nodded, knowing her sister meant well. I thank you for your kindness, but rest assured, she leaned toward her sister and took her shoulder. I need no healer. I am quite well. Let us look to you and not me. Diana. You have a ball soon. Does your gown fit, or will more alterations need to be made? Diana's distraction worked, and Jane suddenly smiled. It's wonderful, she sighed happily but the hem may need some adjustment. Well, run and put it on. I'll follow you in and... 
We'll take a look at it together. We can visit the Modiste this weekend. Yes, that is a good idea. Jane hurried off, picking up the skirt of her gown as she ran inside. The moment she entered through the door, Diana's smile vanished. She sat back so far the wicker seat beneath her creaked. She was not sure what entered her mind first. Was it the thought of loneliness? Or Baron Lexington that concerned her more? She thought of the moment they had said goodbye the night before after dinner. He bowed deeply to her, lingering beside her. It had taken a beat for him to reply to Jane's eager questions, for he had looked so much at Diana. What does he think of me? Diana whispered aloud. Perhaps he thinks me a quiet wallflower, quite alone. Her thoughts were disturbed as the housekeeper hurried forward, ready to collect the tea tray. Thank you, Mrs Hudson, Diana said with a smile to the housekeeper. My pleasure, Mrs Hudson curtsied. Do you know if we have any post today? Diana felt a curiosity as she stood. She may never have written to Bonadea, but there would now be a reply and she was interested as to what it would say. Yes, miss, Mrs Hudson nodded. There are some in the hallway on the silver tray. Shall I collect them for you? There is no need, thank you. I shall fetch them myself. Diana smiled and thanked the housekeeper for her help another time, then walked toward the house, taking a much slower pace than her sister had used. She approached through the front door and neared the mahogany side table, inlaid with marquetry in the top of the wooden surface. She ran her fingers over the patterned top, thinking of where the table had come from. It was from Italy, Sorrento, a gift their father had once brought back for their mother, long ago. The mere thought of Italy conjured images of Lord Lexington and what he must have seen on the continent. I wish I felt free enough to ask him more about his travels. Pushing the thought away, she reached for the silver tray that rested on the table and sifted through the letters. At the bottom of the pile, there was just one letter addressed to Jane in handwriting that Diana did not recognise. This must be it. Bonadea's answer. Chapter 7 Diana Diana took the letter and fidgeted with it for some minutes as she wandered the hallway, uncertain whether to open it or not. It felt like an invasion of privacy, after all. The letter was addressed to Jane and not to her. Yet it was concerning her business. And Jane had written to Bonadea for Diana's sake in the first place. Diana, a voice called from upstairs. Come, tell me what you think. She stuffed the letter in her pocket and hastened up the stairs, hurrying toward her sister's room. In the chamber she found Jane already wearing her gown. It was a fine dress indeed, pale pink and flattering, cinched high on the waist to emphasise her petite figure. It was not overly fussy with ruffles or ribbons, but simpler and more elegant, with capped sleeves and a hemline embroidered with roses. What do you think? Jane asked, turning in a circle and presenting the gown. I think it's quite beautiful, but yes, the gown could be taken up a little, Diana said, stepping forward and trying to forget the letter she had just retrieved. Yet it burned in the back of her mind, like an itch that could not be scratched. She stepped forward, dropped to her knees and reached for the hem, rolling it up a little. Yes, we will visit the Modista tomorrow to get it sorted for you. Thank you. Jane sighed contentedly, turning repeatedly around as she gazed in the standing mirror. What gown will you wear to the ball? One of my usual ones. Diana didn't think much about it, for she was too busy thinking of how much Jane would attract attention at the ball. Her natural sweetness and her confidence were charming in themselves. But the gown certainly flattered her. Many men would be staring at her. Maybe Lord Lexington has noticed her. An ugly feeling of envy curled in Diana's gut, and she hated herself for it. She longed for Jane to be happy, and any attraction or fascination she felt for Lord Lexington should not be disturbing that wish. Who shall you dance with? 
Diana asked as she stood. Many men, who shall you dance with? Jane turned to face her. I have not danced at one of these events for years. You know that. Diana brushed it off with a laugh. Once gossip had spread that Diana was a spinster, the offers of dancing had dried up. These days, she hovered at the sides of rooms, as noticeable as the wallpaper. Occasionally she talked with other ladies, despaired of their gossip, then moved on, eager to watch over her sister and ensure she was enjoying herself. You must dance, you must, Jane said with eagerness, and took her hands. What of our new friend, Lord Lexington? Surely he will dance with you. I think it unlikely, Diana murmured quickly, not wishing to hold on to hope of something that seemed so impossible. He is quite dashing, is he not? He will be a curiosity to ladies too, for he has returned from his travels after so long. Many ladies will be vying for his hand. His hand in terms of a dance or his hand in terms of marriage, Jane giggled. Both, I imagine. Diana couldn't explain why the thought of seeing Lord Lexington marry made her gut tighten. What is wrong with me? I barely know the man. Come, you try on your gown for the evening. I'm sure you have a fine one. Hurry to your chamber, I shall join you there as soon as I've changed out of my gown. Jane bustled her toward the door, waving her arms in the air. Diana laughed at her sister's eagerness and wandered the hallway. When she reached her chamber, she opened the door and peered inside. It had been some years since she had bought a new gown. Her uncle had frequently offered to buy her a new one, yet she had turned it down, saying it was wiser the new gowns should go to Jane. Reaching inside the cupboard, she pulled out a variety of gowns. They were all very plain, really quite dull as she laid them across the bed. For the first time, Diana did not wish to wear any of them. Putting distance between herself and those gowns, she sat in the window seat, staring at them across the room. Lord Lexington would not ask me to dance if I wore one of those, she murmured aloud to herself. He may not notice me, for I'd blend in with the walls. She huffed and looked down, adjusting the skirt of her gown so much that she heard a crinkle of paper. The letter. Glancing to the door and ensuring her sister would not yet disturb her, she reached for the letter and held it tightly in her hands. Inhaling sharply, she found some courage and opened the letter, finding Bonadea's handwriting was scribbled neatly across the pages. Dear Miss Jane Schaub, what a letter to receive from you. I must confess myself both worried for your sister, but warmed by your love for her to come to me and ask for advice. Melancholy is a condition that plagues many of us in this world. I have heard it called many things over the years, and some people suffer with it more than any other. It is something I never prescribe tonics for, as I believe that true melancholy is something that resides in the spirit. It's an absence of happiness brought on by prolonged worry or fear. Diana broke off, lowering the letter momentarily. There was something so accurate in Bonadea's words that she felt as if the lady was in the room with her, sitting beside her and nudging her to keep reading. She turned her attention back down to the letter and continued on. Here is the advice I recommend giving to your sister, and I pray that some day it may be of use to her. If there is something that causes her sadness or fear, then it is time to tackle the problem. One's worries in this world cannot be solved by ignoring them. By accepting there is a fear is the first step, for it helps one to separate that sadness from the other things in your life. I once met a woman who had fallen into such a perpetual state of melancholy that she realised she was sad quite by habit, more than any great fear that hung over her life. Rather than making the most of her days, seeking adventure, happiness or just reasons to smile, she had grown used to staying indoors and staring out of windows, wishing for something more in life. This is a state of dwelling in sadness that does no good. If this is your sister's state of mind, then here is the greatest advice I can give to her. Escape your house. Escape the repetition. 
Try something new and live your life afresh. One's life can only change by making the decision to change it. Seek out small reasons to smile, whether that is just the simplicity of enjoying a cup of tea or treating oneself to a new purchase. These simple enjoyments can build to greater happiness. Take risks. Be bolder. For quietness and timidity can often lead to sitting in window seats and not doing much with one's days. Diana looked down at the window seat where she perched and leapt to her feet, hurrying away from it. That is not to say there are not moments for quietness and reflection. Of course there are. But if every day is filled with such inward thought, with no excitement or action, then a mind has no choice but to dwell on the bad. These quiet moments should be saved for thinking of happy times, days out, adventure, falling in love, risking everything, and meeting new friends. Diana's hands tightened around the letter as she turned the page, reading faster now as her heart thudded in her chest. No one's life is without sadness, but it is how we live our other days that can define our mood. If I can speak to your sister directly now, pray, tell her this from me. Miss Diana Sharp, you have every reason to be happy in this world. You have a full life ahead of you, a sister that is devoted to you, and so much potential for happiness. All it needs is for you to reach out and take it. Gone are the days of dwelling on sadness and staring through windows at the rain. Take action. Do something with your life, no matter how small. Once you feel in control of your days and make the most of them, smiles and laughter will surely follow. I pray this advice helps in some regard. Always feel free to write to me again. Your helper, Bonadea. Diana smiled as she looked up from the letter, startled by the effect Bonadea's words had had on her. Was it true she had spent so long fearing loneliness that she had let it engulf her being? Had she spent so long sitting still inside that she'd forgotten to make the most of her days? Heavens, this woman is right, Diana murmured, knowing it to be true. She had looked inwardly for too long and had forgotten to look at other things. Diana, Jane knocked gently on the door. Are you decent? I... Diana hurried to hide the letter, stuffing it in a writing bureau in the corner of the room. Yes, come in. The door opened and Jane stepped inside, wearing her day gown again. Are these the ones you're thinking of wearing? She walked toward the bed and looked at the gowns, her smile slipping form place. Diana, they are rather plain. Yes, I suppose they are. Diana sighed as she walked across the room, her gaze flitting across the gowns. You agree? Jane dropped down, sitting on the edge of the bed. You look shocked. I am, Jane declared with vigour. I once told you that you had picked the dullest bonnet in a shop, and you insisted that the plain beige ribbon was a vibrant enough colour for you. I quite feared you disappearing into the shadows. She laughed and gestured to the gowns. You agree these are plain? I do. Diana raised the gowns and put them away, back in the cupboard. Her movements became faster as she thought of what Bonadea had said, right down to the details of doing small things to make yourself happy, as well as the bigger things in life. Maybe it is time I bought a new gown. Jane jumped to her feet and clasped her hands together. I'm so glad you have said that. She beamed as she took Diana's hand and grasped it in her own. Come, let us go to our uncle to make the arrangements for our visit to the Modiste tomorrow. I'm sure he has the money to buy you a new gown. Yes, as you wish. Diana smiled as she followed her sister. She was eager to do as Bonadea said, for the letter had changed something for her. Yet as she walked away, a nervousness fluttered in her gut as if a hundred moths and butterflies danced about beneath her skin. I have never purchased a bold gown before. What would? Lord Lexington think if I did. 
A brief image entered her mind of being at a ball in some colourful gown, with Lord Lexington walking toward her and offering his hand. Perhaps I could take a risk. Maybe you could wear your new gown when Lord Lexington comes again for dinner tomorrow. He's coming again? Diana asked, feeling a little breathless at the thought. Chapter 8 Diana, Lord Lexington, you are most welcome. Lord Cobham welcomed him with a booming voice and gestured for him to enter the house. Diana walked slowly down the stairs, resting her hands on the skirt of her new gown and trying to flatten out any creases that might exist. She gazed at the skirt, so nervous that she chewed the inside of her mouth. It was a gown she would never normally wear, but just as Bona Dea had said to her, she was taking risks tonight. The silk was dusky blue with a sash high around the waist, tucked just under the bust. The hemmed neckline, embroidered with darker thread, emphasised the curve of her chest, and the thinly veiled skirt skimmed her hips, accenting the slimness of her figure. She stopped on the bottom step, looking toward her sister and her uncle who greeted Lord Lexington. He stepped inside, offered his top hat and frock coat to Simpkins, then greeted them all with a bow. It is good to see you again. He stood straight, and his eyes flicked past Jane, coming to settle on Diana. When his expression changed, with his lips parting, she shifted her weight between her feet, uncertain what to make of that expression. Was it awe? Certainly not. For what gentleman would ever look at her with awe? Perhaps it is bafflement, for I do not normally wear such gowns. She hung her head and stepped off the stairs. How does your business fare now you are back home? Lord Cobham began a conversation about business, and Lord Lexington answered him swiftly. Yet as Diana walked toward him, he seemed distracted and repeatedly looked at her. He paused in the conversation about business and bowed to her in greeting. Miss Schaub, he said his voice deepening. You look quite remarkable this evening. Thank you. Diana tried to cover up her stammer and coughed a little. Thirsty, sister, Jane said, looping her arm with Diana's. Thank you for your help, sister. Or I fear I would still look like a fool. Come, let us all get a drink, she said with ease and led Diana away. Just once did Diana glance back to Lord Lexington as he followed, walking alongside her uncle. Lord Cobham spoke quickly, barely taking a breath, as was his usual habit. The whole time Lord Lexington looked at Diana, murmuring the occasional kind word to Lord Cobham. In the front room, Simpkins poured them each a glass of wine, and Lord Lexington took it upon himself to help, passing the glasses around the group. The simple kindness warmed her greatly. When he passed his glass to her, their fingers brushed across the stem, and the jolt that passed up her arm nearly made her drop the glass. Diana held on tight to the glass, her eyes lingering on Lord Lexington as she tried to seek out if he had felt that got too, or if it was all in her imagination. He smiled at her but showed no sign of having felt it. She had to hold back a sigh as her uncle drew Lord Lexington into conversation again. Now, my lord, you must tell us more of your travels. A diplomat, eh? What sights you must have seen these last few years? He spoke with enthusiasm, just as he took part in every other conversation in life with equal gusto. It has its moments, certainly. I'm sure you're being modest, Lord Cobham cut off Lord Lexington good-naturedly. It was a habit of his talking over one without necessarily realising he had done it, in his kindly way. What people you must have met too. Royalty, Jane suggested as she moved to stand beside Diana. Occasionally, Lord Lexington said. He didn't raise his chin high as some men would have done when making such an admission. His countenance led Diana to admire him all the more. He was a humble man, despite his connections. What royals? Jane asked with eagerness. 
Shall we make a game of it? Lord Cobham asked as he topped up his drink. What of the Russian royals now that would certainly be something? Well, Lord Lexington tried to speak, but Jane was equally caught up in the game now. What of the German emperors or the Hanovers? Have you met them, my lord? She asked, elbowing Diana to get her attention. What glory that would be! Diana tried to stop her sister elbowing her, for she was too distracted looking at Lord Lexington. He was looking back at her, and the two shared a humoured smile. My apologies, my lord, she whispered, moving a step closer toward him. She tried to feel bold, imbued with courage at the movement, just as Bonadea had urged her to be. Yet her fingers shook around the glass with nervousness. My sister and my uncle get very excited at times. Believe me, it is a pleasant change in conversation, he said in a whispered tone to her. Lord Cobham and Jane had not noted their conversation. They were far too busy guessing other royal names. Queen Charlotte, perhaps? their uncle offered. Oh my, imagine that, Jane said with awe and fluttered a hand in front of her face. Dinner with a queen. May I make a guess? Diana said, in a softer tone to the Baron. Please do, he encouraged her on, gesturing to her with his glass and curving his body in her direction. The devotion of his attention to her had a heat rising in her cheeks. Don't lose courage now. Perhaps the Prince Regent? she asked. At once Lord Lexington smiled. Bravo, he applauded her. Yet in truth it is not so wondrous a thing to share dinner with a prince. You think not? Her lips parted in wonder. My lord, there are many in this country who would be in awe for you to share dinner with such a man as he. You'd be surprised how dull the dinner is. I am not disparaging the Prince Regent in any way. It is that at dinners like that, everyone is so concerned with being in his good opinion, they forget how to talk freely, with passion, with interest. He gestured to her sister and uncle, such as a gathering as this. The King himself, I dare say, Lord Cobham suggested. Gosh, I may swoon. Jane's words had them laughing together. The people interest you, Diana said with perception, turning her head back toward Lord Lexington. Not positions, not titles, but the people. You are right, Miss Shorb, quite right indeed. Titles can be boring if the person they are attached to is not so interesting, he confessed in a murmur. That's why I'm glad to be here tonight. His eyes lingered on hers. Does he mean me? She felt breathless, her mouth dry, and hastily took a sip from her glass. Well, shall we go through for dinner? This way, my lord. Lord Cobham led the way to the dining room. Diana went to follow, only to find Lord Lexington's arm presented beside her, offering to escort her. With bated breath, she took that arm, feeling that same jolt passing through her. This time, she was certain he felt something of it, as he sighed as they walked on. Diana glanced back at her sister just in time to see Jane do a little hop of excitement as she looked between Diana and Lord Lexington. Diana narrowed her eyes, urging Jane to not be quite so excited. As they reached the dining room, Lord Lexington held out Diana's chair for her as a perfect gentleman and sat beside her. Lord Cobham drew him into conversation about his diplomatic work once again, and Diana felt envy curl in her stomach. She longed to talk to Lord Lexington freely, but her uncle dominated the conversation. It left her making stolen glances in Lord Lexington's direction, though she said little. Well, my lord, how are you enjoying being back in the county? Jane asked, talking over her uncle in order to take part in the conversation. Very much so. He nodded as he ate. Diana reached forward and topped up his glass of wine. He turned to her and offered a smile of thanks. She tried not to think of how such a simple smile made her cheeks warm. My one regret is that 
I have not explored the old walks I used to take. Not as much as I would like to yet. Have you heard of old Harry Rocks? The cliffs on the coast, Lord Cobham said as he added more chicken to his plate. Most certainly. I was thinking of taking a walk there this week, to explore the place again. What good fortune for that is Diana's favourite place, Jane declared with a broad smile. Is it not, sister? Diana nearly choked on her wine. She managed to stop herself from coughing and spluttering, though her throat was tight, and she was unable to say anything for a minute. Is that true, Miss Shawb? Lord Lexington looked at her, waiting for an answer. Yes, my lord. Diana managed to speak at last, though she kept her eyes down at her plate, worried that her near choke had made her cheeks as red as a tomato. Embarrassment took over, and she feared she could not meet Lord Lexington's eye at all. I have often thought what a mystical place it is. As though one stands at the edge of the world when they stand there, Lord Lexington offered. He had observed something she often thought. Just so. She managed to look up at last, meeting his gaze in surprise. Well, perhaps you could join me for a walk there tomorrow. Lord Lexington spoke fast, looking around the table. All of you, of course. I regret I cannot come as I have work to attend to, but please go ahead, Lord Cobham encouraged, picking up his wine glass. I'm afraid I have prior engagements too, Jane said with ease and shrugged. What engagements? Diana frowned. She had helped organise Jane's calendar, ensuring she was invited to every important event of the season. How would it be possible that Jane was invited to something she did not know about? Just tea with a friend, Jane said, though she didn't meet Diana's gaze, showing she was lying. Yet you and Lord Lexington should go on your walk without me. So that is what you are up to. Diana didn't know whether to be thankful for Jane's art or irked she was being so thrown together with Lord Lexington when she feared he did not look at her as she saw him. I'd be glad of your company, Miss Shawb, if you can spare the time. Lord Lexington paused with his meal and waited for her answer. Diana sat very still, her nerves making her fidget with her cutlery for a second. At any other time in life, she would have turned him down. Her priority was Jane, always. From the day their mother had died, she had been Jane's carer, her watcher. That meant being with her most days and never indulging in anything so selfish as a walk with a man she admired. Yet Bonadea's letter had burned onto her mind, with the words ringing out like a bell echoing in her ears. Gone are the days of dwelling on sadness and staring through windows at the rain. Take action. Yes, my lord, Diana said, imbued by confidence as she smiled at the baron. I'd be delighted to join you there. He sat taller in his seat, and his own smile broadened so wide, Diana wondered why she... Chapter 9 Arnold Miss Schaub Arnold offered his hand to Miss Schaub as her carriage door opened. It was a windy day at the top of the cliffs that marked the edge of the coast, and as she stepped down she raised her other hand to hold on to her bonnet. Gosh, it's blustery. She held tightly to his hand as the wind buffeted her gown. Arnold's top hat blew off his head and collided with the side of the carriage. Perhaps just a little, he jested, thrilled when Miss Shaw burst out laughing. The top hat was caught by the carriage footman who offered the hat back to Arnold. Thank you. He tucked it under his arm, having no wish to put it on again and lose it over the cliffs. Shall we take that walk? I'd be delighted. Miss Sharp didn't release his hand as they stepped up the stony incline toward the top of the cliffs. A maid and the footman followed behind them as their chaperones. Arnold glanced their way, rather relieved they seemed more interested in talking to one another than paying attention to him and their mistress. 
He took advantage of that moment and looped Miss Shorb's hand through his arm. He told himself it was so he could keep her safe on this treacherous path overlooking the cliffs. The truth was he didn't want to let go of her just yet. She held his arm with a soft grasp. He found himself wishing she would hold him tighter. You are fond of this place then? he asked as he drew her up the slope toward the best view of the great stacks. The more they climbed, the harder the wind grew. Very, she said, calling to be heard above the wind. When I was young, my mother used to tell me tales of how these cliffs got their name, Old Harry Rocks. What is the tale? he asked with intrigue. Some say that a pirate called Old Harry hid his treasure in a cave in the cliffs last century. She laughed at the idea. Others claim the devil. Old Harry himself rose from the ocean one day and sat on one of the chalk stacks, deep in thought. He was seen by many, hence the name that followed. Now I'm not sure which tale I like more. He led her to the top of the cliffs and they came to a stop. The blue ocean stretched out in front of them, filling the air with the salty scent. The white stacks stood out in the sea like giant mountains of sugar that had been dropped from the clouds. I heard many such similar tales on the continent, such stories, enough to fill volumes, all as fascinating as each other. I must confess, I'm fascinated by your life, my lord. My life? Surely not. He laughed at the idea and led her along the cliff path. When the wind grew worse, she raised a hand and took off her bonnet, knowing she couldn't keep it on any more. Her blonde hair danced in the wind, and he felt an urge to push a curl back from her face. He just managed to resist it, but offered to carry her bonnet with his top hat instead. She smiled, thanking him for it. I'm not sure my life warrants as fascinating. But it is, she said with vigour. There was something different about Miss Sharp today. As she spoke to him, there was confidence, a freedom in her. He wondered if just separating her from the house and her uncle, that dominated conversation, had freed her enough to talk with him so openly. You have lived life to the full. You have explored and adventured. You must have enjoyed life. I have, but it has its turns, its peaks and troughs, as every life must take, he assured her as they walked on. Her slim shoes slipped on the chalk path, having not nearly as much grip as his own boots. He tightened his arm around her hand to stop her from falling, loving the way her hand gripped him tightly. Thank you, she whispered, her voice barely audible on the wind. She blushed a deep shade of pink, so pleasant a shade it was hard for him to look at the path ahead and not at her. You make me worry for what troughs you have faced, my lord. The same sadness that others suffer in life, I am sure, he said softly. Fearing how close they were to the cliff edge, he led her across the open grass, toward another chalky path, wishing to keep her safe. Like yourself, I've known grief for lost loved ones. Indeed, her hand tightened on his arm, this time it was an act of comfort. The loss of those loved ones, it can sometimes leave us lonely. That is why I'm glad of Jane's company. She smiled sweetly. She is my dearest friend. You have devoted yourself to her protection, have you not? At Arnold's question, Miss Shorb looked sharply at him, her eyes wide in wonder. I have noticed you are a perceptive woman, Miss Shorb. I do not declare to have your skill but I have noticed your affection for her, your care. Yes, indeed. I am devoted to her. I have always vowed to protect her, as our mother was no longer here to do the same. She looked outward to the ocean, her blonde hair dancing in the wind again, that breeze softened, as if God had sensed the need for seriousness and her voice to be heard. I have made Jane my priority in life. Over your own happiness? Precisely. 
It is what one does for those they love. She smiled, but there was a hint of sadness to her now. Forgive me for being bold, but may I venture a guess? He asked, glancing back at their chaperones who had dropped back a little. The distance gave him the confidence to be open with her. Please do. I am surprised you are not married, Miss Shorb. He could tell his words had affected her, for her hand loosened on his arm, but he did not let her release him. I do not mean to be impertinent, but open. Have you not married perhaps because you have sought to satisfy your sister's happiness over your own? I think you did yourself a disservice when you said you were not as perceptive as I. She laughed softly at him. You are right. In return, may I ask why you are not married, my lord? Do I have charms enough to be wed, Miss Schaub? He asked with flirtation, loving the way she blushed and hung her head forward, trying to hide that colouring. In truth, I have been focused on work for so long I did not seek out a wife. No lady has ever quite captivated me enough, either. I find myself longing for a friend, a companion. Someone... He hesitated, his eyes lingering on her as they came to a stop at the edge of the cliff path, looking out to the ocean again. She was truly beautiful, and there was an attentiveness in her manner. Even as she looked at the sea, her head was inclined toward him, showing she was listening. Someone I admire. Then you must find this companion, she said, as the wind picked up again. She stepped back, her free hand reaching for the skirt of her gown to hold it down. Goodness, it is windy. Indeed. I fear I shall fall. I would not let that happen, he assured her, tightening his arm further around her hand. She stepped toward him, nestling closer into his side. It was an intimate position, one that had his heart fluttering in his chest, as if butterflies hovered beneath the skin. We can walk back if you like. Oh no, I love this view. You have told me a secret, so I shall tell you one in return. At her words he bent down toward her, longing to hear her better. I love this view. She nodded her head at the chalk stacks and the ocean with the white horses riding the waves. It reminds me that there is a world beyond this shore, a world I would love to see some day. Maybe some day you will, Miss Schaub. He had so nearly called her by her Christian name, his mouth turned dry. She smiled at him, but clearly didn't believe him. Well, if you wish to see more of the world, and I long to see more of the county, now I am home again, perhaps we could share more walks such as this. I'd be glad of that, my lord, very glad indeed. Arnold took Miss Schaub by the hand once again. These days it was second nature to him, and she held his hand with just as much firmness. He helped her down from the carriage and they strode out along the beach together, occasionally slipping in the sand. But as they held on to each other, neither one of them fell. What a beautiful day it is, Miss Sharp declared as she looked at the sea. The sun shone brightly today, making her blonde hair seem even lighter in the rays. Would you not agree? I would. He had to tear his gaze away from her. These last four weeks they had seen each other many times, if not twice a week, then thrice. They practically lived in each other's pockets, and he'd been for dinner at her uncle's house many times. They were always chaperoned, constantly, and as time went on, Arnold found himself resenting that presence. He glanced behind them, glad to see that the maid and footman who accompanied them, once again, seemed more interested in their own conversation. Studland is a fine sight indeed, she sighed with awe as they hesitated on the beach. There were others here today. Some men paddled in the shallows with their trousers rolled up to their knees, and ladies sat on blankets, carrying parasols over their heads to protect them from the rays. I suppose it is nothing to the beaches of France that you saw. Believe me, this is something special, he confessed. Yet I wish I could show you the depth of waves you can get in France, particularly on the south coast. 
you can stand on the beach and feel dwarfed. It's a reminder of the world's natural power. I could not help but stare agog at such a sight. I must have looked quite the bumbling fool staring in amazement at waves. He laughed at himself, encouraging her to laugh too. Come, tell me more about France, she pleaded. They walked on together, and Arnold was thrilled to find she did not let go of his hand. By now, they would have usually released hands, or she would take his arm, but not today. Something had shifted between them, and she maintained this intimate hold. As he spoke of France, captivating her in his tales, he scarcely paid attention to his own words. He was much more concerned with Miss Schaub. Over these last few weeks, he could not deny his admiration for her, had grown into something beyond which he had thought possible. It's not just admiration anymore, is it? It's attachment, pure devotion. When he woke in the morning, he thought of her, going to sleep at night. He certainly thought of her, sometimes allowing his mind to stray to illicit matters he knew he should not be thinking of, though he could not help it. As she held his hand, his heart pounded in his chest, and when she looked away across the beach, he obsessively wished she'd look at him again. What is wrong with me? I can no longer think straight. You seem distracted today, my lord, she said as they wandered closer to the ocean. She released his hand and reached down, picking up conch shells with perfect dusky pink spirals. Is everything well? Very well, indeed. He followed behind her as she collected more shells. I suppose my thoughts are somewhat distracted today, that is all. What concerns you? You, my lady. The words fell from his lips surprisingly easily. She spun back so fast to face him she dropped her shells. He laughed and bent down, picking them up for her again and passing them into her palm. Their fingers brushed together and he felt her flinch. He looked up, fearing what it meant. When he saw her blush and smile, it gave him hope. Well, I have already begun by being bold, so I should continue, should I not? I have never known you to be nervous she said softly. Perhaps now I am. He walked on, with her hurrying at his side, her eyes now watching him rather than the ocean alone. I was thinking how like your namesake you are, the Roman goddess. Oh, she sounded a little disappointed, turning her chin down. It is a good thing, he chuckled at her reaction. I have always associated her with that strong hunter's image, the protector. I have seen time and time again this last month how like her you are, protecting your sister, those that you love. You are kind, my lord, she whispered, and bent down, collecting more shells. He picked up a few more and offered them to her for her collection. Yet there is a part of Diana, the goddess, that I fear too. Fear? She was alarmed and hurried to his side, moving her shells into one hand as she took his arm. Surely you do not fear me. Not in any way, he deepened his tone. These last few weeks have been wondrous. Diana. He broke and used her Christian name, as he had longed to do for so long. Surely you cannot be in any doubt of my attachment to you, not after all these weeks. She stared at him, her lips parted, but words clearly failed her. I am devoted. He glanced around them, yet their chaperones were distracted, running away from the waves. He took her hand from his arm and turned it over, slowly lifting it to his lips. She didn't pull away, though he tested the waters constantly, moving so slowly that she had ample time to pull back if she wished to. When he kissed the back of her hand, she smiled, with such a full expression he felt giddy. I have never seen her smile in that way before. The Roman goddess is a maiden goddess, he whispered. You ask what I fear and that is it, that the Diana I know, the Diana I am so attached to, will remain unmarried as the goddess did. Oh, she gasped, her eyes flicking down to the grasp he still had on his hand. You and I have talked much 
these last few weeks of my travels. Now he had begun, he could not stop. All the words he'd rehearsed saying to her one day now poured out of him with passion and in a rush. He didn't want to wait for his life to start anew with Diana. He wished it to be now, with the two of them not just companions, but something much more intimate. I have seen how much you long for adventure of your own, a chance to explore the world. I am not wrong, am I? I have a fascination for it, yes, she whispered, but I do not understand. She shook her head. Why talk of travels now? Because I wish to offer you something. He breathed deeply and lowered her hand, so it was held between his two. Her palms were warm in his own. Would you like to explore the world, Diana? But not alone. Would you like to explore it with me? Her jaw slackened and she stared at him without blinking. The wind picked off the ocean and buffeted them. They were both forced to step back as her blonde hair whipped around her ears. You mean, she murmured, struggling with the words, as a travelling companion to you? She breathed heavily, and the way her eyes darted down to his hand showed she suspected he meant something else entirely. She needs to hear the words, Why am I such a fool? Say the words. I must say what I truly feel. He loved her, there was no denying that, not any more. Their walks were not just an intimacy, but the greatest part of his days. He couldn't imagine going back to the continent and returning to his work without these moments and her company to look forward to. I mean as my wife, Diana. He heard the crash of waves and turned to see a large wave hurrying to the shore, faster than the others. Some ladies leapt from their blankets speeding away, and one man dressed in a suit was drenched by the wave. Arnold drew Diana back across the sand, one hand in her own, and the other went for her waist, lifting her to safety on a risen bank of sand. She stayed in his arms, not rushing away, as the sea stopped a few inches in front of their shoes, then retreated, the white foam hissing as it sunk back across the sand. Would you, Diana? Arnold asked breathily, so taken up by the excitement of the moment that he struggled to stand still. As others laughed and tittered around them, having come so close to being caught by the wave, he focused on Diana, alone, waiting for her answer. Would you consider doing me the honour of marrying me? Chapter 10 Diana I... Diana was heated. Her whole body was engulfed as if the sun had set her alight with flames. Excitement danced in her stomach as she stared into Lord Lexington's dark eyes. More than anything did she wish to say yes, that she would marry him. These last few weeks, she had been happier than she ever thought she could be. Each day he had brought such lightness to her world that when she woke in the morning she got out of bed with a spring in her step. Whereas before she had retired early at night, wanting the oblivion of sleep, now she stayed up late, talking with Jane and thinking of Lord Lexington and what more travels they could have together. He makes me happy. I... She hesitated, about to say yes. He stepped toward her, his fingers tightening through her own. It was such an intimate touch that her mind wandered. He was bent down toward her in such a way that a kiss was within reach. How I would love to know what that kiss would be like. Her eyes lingered on his lips when a memory broke through her mind. It was of Jane, three days ago. They had returned from a tea party. But Jane was less than happy. She had marched through the house and torn off her bonnet, dismayed at the lack of a fine gentleman. How am I to ever marry if these are the men I meet? Goodness, maybe love is not something that's possible for me. The sadness of the words curt through Diana. She had made a vow to God long ago not to abandon her sister. At her mother's grave, she had thrown a handful of dirt onto the coffin and made a promise. I will put Jane before my own heart, 
forever. Her happiness will come first. I make this vow to my mother and to God. Diana! Lord Lexington whispered her name, clearly on tenterhooks as he waited for his answer. She almost said yes at that moment, but Jane was too strong in her mind. If she were to marry Lord Lexington, what would become of Jane? Would she be rushed into a loveless marriage? Diana could not countenance that. She wished Jane to marry for love, not for immediacy of stability, even if she were to take Jane with her to the continent once she had married Lord Lexington. Then Jane's chances of finding a good match in this country would be out of the window. Oh! Lord Lexington sighed, clearly sensing her answer. I fear I know what you must say. He hung his head, hiding his expression, though his hand clutched hers no less. I fear my answer, she murmured, for I know I must give it even if it is not the one I wish to give. Pray tell what that means. His head lifted again and there was agony in those features. The cheeks were contorted and the skin around his handsome eyes wrinkled. Do you not care for me? How could you think such a thing? She looked around the beach, checking for their chaperones. The footman had been caught in the large wave and was holding his sodden jacket out as the maid laughed at him. They were completely distracted. Diana took the opportunity and moved toward Lord Lexington. She shoved the shells she had been carrying into a pocket of her Spencer jacket and clutched the lapel of his coat, needing to be closer to him. Do not be in doubt of my attachment to you. These last few weeks they have meant everything to me. But, he urged her on, sensing it was coming. But I cannot leave. I cannot. As much as I long to explore... She hesitated, looking out to the ocean and wondering what was beyond. I cannot do it. I'm so sorry, my lord. In every way, I am sorry. She felt cruel with her gut twisted in pain. She was causing pain to the one man she cared for more than any other in this world. He hung his head forward again, hiding his expression. She released his lapel and he loosened their hands. He stepped back from her, creating a distance between them. That air felt so empty, Diana stumbled as the wind picked up between them again. Lord Lexington's hands were not there to keep her standing and she nearly fell over. He lifted his head enough that she could see his expression. The jaw muscles had tightened and he was doing his best to avoid looking her in the eye. I'm so sorry, she said with full heart, wishing she could take back the words. Part of her wished to run into his arms, to embrace him to tell him that she loved him and, of course, she would marry him. I would be breaking my vow to see Jane settled first before myself. I cannot do it. Jane has to come first. Please don't be sorry, he begged of her. You have done nothing wrong, and your words are testament to your good character. I will have to leave for the continent soon, and if you said yes, that would mean parting with me. You do not wish to leave your sister, do you? he whispered. She shook her head, revealing he was right. Come, let us return you home. He offered his arm to her, woodenly now, and turned to walk back along the beach. Ordinarily they would have walked for much longer, but not today. She couldn't blame him for not wanting to stay in her company after what had passed. Slowly she threaded her hand through his arm and allowed him to escort her back down the beach. Diana stared at his profile constantly, but he didn't once look her way. Only when they reached the carriage on the main track behind the beach did he look her in the eye. As a tear slipped out, something she could not fight, he offered up his handkerchief. I'm so sorry, she whispered again. You have nothing to be sorry for. When she tried to pass him the handkerchief back, he refused. You take it. May it be some lasting connection between us after I return to the continent. He's leaving soon? Diana, will you not let me in? I'm sorry, please, Jane, just, just leave me be for now. Diana turned her head into the pillow as her gasping breath returned. 
She only managed to stave off her tears for seconds at a time before they swept in again. She was torn, her heart twisted into pieces so much that she still had not let go of Lord Lexington's handkerchief. Repeatedly she dried her tears with it, but they came again. Soon enough, his handkerchief was sodden, as was the pillow where she laid her head. Jane's footsteps retreated from the bedroom door, and Diana sighed as they left. Since she had returned from her walk with Lord Lexington, she had not left this room. She was too broken-hearted at her own decision. I have no choice, she murmured aloud to herself. I cannot break my vow. I always said I'd see Jane settled first, happy, in love, married. Only when she is sorted can I look to my own heart. With the words, an image of Lord Lexington shot across her mind. It was his handsome face and his dark hair, tugged at by the wind, as he lifted her hand to his lips and kissed the back. The touch of his lips on her bare skin had left her heated, longing to be enfolded in his arms. Oh, stop it, she chastised herself and turned over on the bed, so her other cheek was pressed into the pillow. She toyed with his handkerchief in his hands finding his initials embroidered into the corner. A.B. for Arnold Bowman, the Baron of Lexington. Around the initials was an embroidered pattern, expertly done, forming a perfect square made up of triangles and arrows. It was continental in design, making her think of the offer he had made her. Arnold, she whispered his Christian name aloud, wishing she could think of him in that way always. He hadn't just offered his heart when he'd asked her to marry him, but the life she had dreamt of, too. A life of adventure and exploration. A chance to travel. It was more than she ever could have imagined was possible. Yet I turned him down. Oh, how can I bear it? Diana thrust her face nose down into the pillow, wailing as fresh tears came. As much as she regretted turning him down, she knew it could be no other way. I cannot break my vow. Yet neither could she spend her days crying. It would do for one evening. But to survive without Arnold's friendship, to live with some vague sense of happiness after he returned to the continent, she would have to find a way. Hurriedly, she stood off the bed, using his handkerchief to wipe her cheeks. Moving to the side of the room, she opened up her writing bureau and took out Bonadea's letter. She hastily read the words again that encouraged her to be bold and seek out happiness, though she now realised there was much Bonadea didn't know when she wrote these words. She helps the heart and health, does she not? Diana whispered aloud. With a sudden realisation striking home, she sat and pulled out fresh parchment and a quill, dipping it in ink and writing a letter of her own. She would appeal for Bonadea's help, but this time, unlike the last occasion, it would be in her own name and would not come from Jane. Dear Bonadea, I must thank you for some advice you gave to me via my sister, Miss Jane Shaub. Yet life has now taken another turn, and I fear I must ask your advice again in the wake of a decision I have made. She told Bonadea everything right down to the details she had never revealed to anyone before, not even Jane. She wrote of how she had watched her mother dying with her sickness, how her mother had cried, believing she was abandoning Jane too soon. She had comforted herself that Diana was nearly a woman, and she had been there for Diana's life, but it was not enough. You must take care of Jane. Those were some of the last words her mother had ever said to her. Diana had kissed her mother on the forehead and promised she would. Diana revealed this secret memory to Bonadea and her love for Arnold. For that was what it was, love. Unrestrained and all-encompassing, she did love him, but she was not free to love him so. She explained why she had turned down Arnold's offer and begged for some advice from Bonadea. Many talk of you as a woman who is able to help both one's health and heart. I come to you now to ask for fresh advice. How can one be happy 
when they have turned down love for good reasons. This was no girlish and young fancy, no naive feeling, but true attachment to a man that is the best I have ever known. Not only were we perfect companions for one another, with the same sense of humour, the same interests and deep respect for one another, but there was a passion that lingered deeper. She broke off, thinking of the way Arnold had kissed her hand again. She knew there had been passion there, she'd felt it in the keenness of that kiss. How is one to be happy now, when they have turned their back on the person that is most suited for them in this world? How are either of us to be happy again? I wait your reply with eagerness. Your friend, Miss Diana Schaub. Chapter 11 Arnold, you will be needed at the meeting in Paris in one week. Arnold broke off from the letter, lowering it slowly to his desk. The house was strangely empty, the quiet all the more noticeable than it had ever been before. He kept looking at the door, in the hope that someone would come through. In particular, that Diana would come to see him, but she never did. A week! Just one week! Arnold hissed harshly. After being so still and quiet for so long, his next actions were sudden and rushed. He leapt to his feet and pushed back his chair harshly. It fell over, but he made no effort to collect it again. He had just finished reading a letter regarding his work. With it requiring him to be back in Paris in so short amount of time, he would have to leave soon for the continent again, in just three days' time. It was awful. He turned on the spot and ran his hands over his face, the old habitual habit of nerves doing nothing to alleviate the tension in his stomach and the way his heart fluttered in his chest. Diana, I must leave you so soon. He'd been nursing his heartbreak these last two days since she had refused his hand. He understood why she had done it, for he knew her mind so well. Jane always came first, and she did not wish to abandon her sister. Yet. There had been a part of Arnold that hoped if he and Diana could have a longer courtship, if he could stay in the county for another few months, then perhaps he could have a second chance to persuade her of their union. Maybe she would see in time that Jane could be well looked after, but Diana didn't need to be here for that. Why can't we look to our own happiness? One week, he said again. Good God! I must make the arrangements already. It was such an important meeting he could not afford to put it off, even though he longed to do so. He took two papers and hurried to write them so quickly that his writing was an untidy scrawl, nothing like his usual style. The first was a letter to his colleague assuring him he'd be in Paris. The second letter was to arrange for a pass via a ship in three days' time. As he wrote the letter, he broke off halfway through, wishing he could request two tickets instead of one. I can't go yet. God's wounds. I cannot leave like this. He pushed the papers harshly away, snatched up his tailcoat and ran from the room, hurrying to put the coat on as he left so much that he nearly fell over in his distraction. Bounding out of the house, he rushed to the stable. His staff offered to make up the carriage but he did not have the peace of mind or patience to wait for it, so he saddled a horse instead and rode away from the house. The steed galloped quickly down the drive, taking him far from the Lexington Manor and out across the Dorset countryside, toward the house he had visited repeatedly these last few weeks. As he appeared on the drive, he slowed the pace of the horse a little, his eyes darting between the windows in search of her. Kingston Manor was grand with the summer flowers having grown, and the ivy across the grey stonework reaching out with long green fingers. Arnold saw someone flit between the windows, plainly having noticed his arrival, but as he pulled up with his horse he was disappointed to find it was not Diana who flung open the door, but her sister Miss Jane. My lord! she exclaimed in surprise as he flung himself down from the horse and passed the reins into the waiting hands of a stable boy. 
It is so good to see you. She hastened down the steps in front of the house. You have stayed away these last few days. I have. No doubt you have heard the reason for my absence. He waited for her answer, seeing Jane hang her hand and nod. She was rarely modest, for she was so confident of character. It was testament to her sadness. I confess I do know. It's a great disappointment to me that my sister turned down your offer, she said in a rush, raising her head again. She's scarcely left her chamber these last couple of days. Her tears, oh, they have racked the house. Arnold swallowed, feeling hope rise in his chest. Was it possible that if Diana was so sad about their parting, she might reconsider? Does she love me? Why else would she be so sad? Our uncle was most disappointed too. Miss Jane sighed deeply. He is fond of you, very much so, and he thought you a good match for Diana. As did I. Arnold's eyes flicked to the open door, hoping she would appear. Is she here? I must speak to her. There is something more she must hear now. I am afraid not. Miss Jane shook her head. She went for a walk this morning, and I have not seen her since. Arnold turned on his heel, paced a few steps down the drive, then returned again. He could not leave. Not now. He had to make the arrangements at once for his parting from England's shores, and he could not do that with any commitment until he had spoken to Diana first. Oh! Miss Jane gasped. What is it? he asked, turning to face her again. I see her! Jane pointed out to the garden. She has returned, my lord. Arnold jerked his head round, seeking Diana out. He caught sight of her at a distance. She was ambling slowly through the garden, with a bonnet on her head and the ribbons loose past her shoulders. She trailed a hand through long grasses and daisy bushes beside her, though she didn't once look at the house. I must speak to her, Arnold said, and set off, racing toward her. My lord, you have no chaperone, Miss Jane called, running after him. Then I beg of you, chaperone, from a distance, I must speak freely to her, Arnold pleaded, walking with such purpose and speed that Miss Jane struggled to keep up with him anyway. Of course, she didn't hesitate in agreeing to his terms. He crossed the lawn, with Jane dropping further and further back behind him. Miss Shorb, he called, knowing he had to return to formality when Miss Jane could overhear him. Diana looked up from the daisies. When she saw him, her face paled. She turned away, then turned back again, wringing her hands together, as if she did not know what to do with herself. Diana, he said in a softer tone, as he reached her. My lord, you're back. The skin around her eyes was red, and his handkerchief was still in her palm. You have been crying. He reached for her hand, needing to be closer to her. My heart. That is all, she murmured, looking down at the grasp he had on her hand. Forgive me for coming unprepared. I imagine after what passed between us the other day, you must not wish to see me again. Far from it. Her words captured his attention. Bees buzzed past them, interested in the flowers, but he barely noticed and hardly cared if he was stung, for he hung on to her ever word. I am still attached to you, my lord, no matter what the nature of my refusal was. Never think you are unwelcome here. Thank God for that. He nearly lifted her hand to his lips to kiss it, but glanced back, aware that Miss Jane hovered on the other side of the flowerbed, watching them from a distance. She may not have been able to hear their words, but he knew he couldn't take the liberty of kissing Diana's hand. It is with regret I must tell you I am to leave soon. How soon? Diana asked, her words coming quickly. In three days. Heavens! She released his hand, fussing with this handkerchief once again. That is soon. It was no expected. 
He shook his head. I have a meeting in Paris I must attend, so I will make the arrangements at once. I understand, she nodded, though the movement of her neck showed she also gulped, as if holding back words. I... She shook her head and fell quiet. He longed to know what she was tempted to say, but Diana had only ever been completely free when they were out exploring together. In those moments she was open with him, her true self. Here, within the shadows of her house and under the eager gaze of her sister, she was quiet again. I wish you a safe journey. I wish you well, my lord. Do not say that. What? she asked, her chin herking upward. Do not speak to me as if we shall never say a word to one another again, he begged of her, stepping closer toward her. This is not goodbye forever, my lord. I pray it is not, she murmured. As do I. He glanced back at Jane again, who was pretending interest in a rosebush nearby. Diana, I must speak to you openly. If I am to leave in three days, then Lord only knows how long it may be before I have the opportunity to do so again. You can always speak freely with me, she said in earnest, though her fidgeting with his handkerchief had grown worse. I beg you to reconsider your answer the other day. His voice was low and soft, yet it had a sudden effect on her. She froze, her hands stiffening around the handkerchief. I understand if you refuse me because you do not care for me. I do care for you. You cannot be in doubt of that. She shook her head with vigour. Then why deny us happiness now? He asked with desperation. Diana, I'm in love with you. As the Romans pledged their adoration for their goddess, Diana, I pledge something much stronger to you. He couldn't hold back his passion. Please, reconsider. I would work every day to make you as happy as you possibly could be. And I believe that together, we could indeed be happy. My law, pray, listen to me. She stepped toward him and just as she had done the other day, she took a soft hold of the lapel of his jacket with the palm of her hand resting on his chest. It was an intimate touch one he wished to indulge in. Do not doubt the strength of my affection for you, but I cannot marry you. Her breath hitched as she lowered her gaze. It would mean breaking a vow to another. It is something I cannot do. This other vow comes first. Arnold lost his breath. His heartbeat slowed and he felt tears prick his eyes. He had not cried in years, not since he had lost his parents, but it was the closest he had come in a long time. I'm so sorry, Diana said, her breath catching in her throat. As am I. Arnold threw caution to the wind, hardly caring that Miss Jane was chaperoning them. He took Diana's hand and kissed the back, holding on to that kiss longer than was really appropriate, though he could not help himself. She closed her eyes as if in equal thrill and agony at that touch. Goodbye, Diana. I will leave in a few days, and I promise I will not trouble you again. He released her hand and backed up. She moved forward, following him, then falling still. He held her gaze for a moment, then turned and walked away, avoiding looking at Miss Jane as he passed her. He could not look either of them in the eye any longer for fear they would see the pain and the tears that lingered there. I thought the first time my heart was broken by Diana was enough. This time it hurts even more. Chapter 12 Diana What have you done? Jane rapped on the door, begging entrance, but Diana refused to let her sister in. Diana, you cannot stay forever in that chamber. I can another day, she insisted. She had not yet fully risen and wore her nightgown with a shawl over her shoulders and her blonde hair loose around her ears. You should not 
have to put up with me and my tears, Jane. Seek your own happiness. You have a tea party later today. Damn the tea party, Jane called from the door. Jane! Diana stood off her bed. Be careful of your language. Call it testament to my strength of feeling. Jane rapped on the door another time. If you do not let me in this minute, I will find a way to barge through that door. You will do no such thing. Diana marched to the door. It's not becoming of a lady. And God forbid I should do anything that is unbecoming of a lady. Yes, you have taught me well. But sometimes someone wishes to be a little freer than that, Jane called from the other side of the door. On the count of three, I'll throw myself at this door. You will not, Diana insisted, folding her arms as she glared at the door. I want answers from you, so here it is. One, two, and... Diana flung open the door just in time for Jane to run through it. She caught herself on a nearby chair and fell into the seat. Any other time Diana would have laughed at her sister, but she couldn't manage a smile now. Well, it was a softer landing than the door would have been. Jane stood and straightened out the creases of her nightgown, showing she had not dressed yet for the day either. You have avoided speaking to me the last two days. Enough is enough, she said sharply. Tell me once and for all, why did you turn down Lord Lexington's offer of marriage? Twice, I might add. Diana slowly closed the door and walked across the room. To save the maid a task, she made the bed. It gave her a distraction from her sister's words. Do not tell me any lies about you not caring for him. Jane said, rounding the bed to catch Diana's eyes. When Diana took a pillow and tried to lay it at the head of the bed, Jane snatched it from her hands. Something tells me you don't know how to make a bed, Diana protested. I know how to stop you doing it and focus on me. Jane tossed the pillow onto the floor. Jane! Speak to me, Jane begged, walking around the bed and coming to face Diana. I know you care for him. Don't deny it. I wasn't going to, Diana said in a small tone, folding her arms. Then tell me why on earth you refuse him. Jane's words hung in the air, unanswered. Would it have anything to do with this? She pulled out something from the sleeve of her gown, revealing a sealed envelope. What is it? Then Diana's face paled and she grew cold, as she recognised Bonadea's handwriting on the letter. I need that, Jane. She tried to take the letter, but Jane snatched it away and walked around the bed. Oh, no, you don't. You think I don't know who this is from, Jane said, escaping from her. How do you know? Diana cried in panic, hurrying after her sister and trying to take the letter back. In the end, Jane ran across the bed in her effort to escape and Diana fell face first onto the mattress. This is ridiculous. You know who that's from? She pushed herself up. I may have sent another letter to Bonadea asking why she hadn't replied. Jane smiled and waved the letter tauntingly in the air. Fortunately, her answer explained that she had indeed replied. That meant someone else had taken the letter. She gestured at Diana with the envelope. I know her handwriting. So, imagine my surprise when this letter arrived this morning. Shall we read it? No, Jane, don't. Diana rounded the bed again, hurrying to her sister. But Jane broke the wax seal and jumped up onto the bed, out of reach. I shall read it aloud, she declared, clearing her throat as if she were an actor on the stage. You and I need to talk about your manners as a lady, Diana huffed. There's a time and place for being a lady and being reserved. When I'm wondering why my sister has turned down the love of her life, when he asked her to marry him, I'd say there's no time to be reserved now. She unfolded the letter and cleared her throat again. As she began to read, Diana stood back, wringing her hands together, as she realised she could no longer stop her sister from seeing what was in the letter. Dear Miss Diana, Schaub, I must confess, 
how saddened I was to read your letter. My latest correspondence with your sister assured me of your happiness and indeed the potential for you to be in love. Based on your letter, there is now much I wish to say to you, and I pray you will shift the obedience and loyalty you have to you vow in your mind far enough for you to hear my words. What vow? Jane broke off and looked up from the letter. Diana didn't answer but sat down on a stool by her vanity table. Beside her on the table were the shells she had taken from Studland Beach. She toyed with them for a few seconds, thinking of Arnold, then fell still. When Jane had no answer, she continued reading aloud. Your vow to your mother to protect your sister is a kind one, a heartfelt one, but it may no longer be as necessary as you once thought it. As Jane read the words, the gusto left her voice. She sat down on the edge of the bed, her eyes wide on the letter as she went on. Protection is only needed as far as the one being protected wishes for it. You should not harm your own life, treating it as an expense, and your happiness as something that is worthy of being thrown away, simply for the endeavour of seeing your sister settled and married before you. Is this true? Jane asked sharply. Diana slumped forward on the stool, resting her elbows on her knees. Diana, what Bonadea says, is it true you made this vow? You know I have always protected you, Diana whispered. Our mother was so sad that she was not going to be there to help guide you through life. I promised her, and to God, that I would take that place, your happiness, your marriage. She breathed deeply and looked down at the floor unable to meet her sister's gaze. It was always going to come before my own. Well, Jane huffed. There is much I have to say on that matter, but let me read what more Bonadea has to say first. I urge you not to predict what your sister feels, but to ask her before you make a decision that impacts her as well. If you love this man as much as I suspect you do, then you could be throwing away a great happiness indeed. And what is it all for in the end? Only your own sadness, and your sister's too, for I know Miss Jane could never be happy in her own marriage if she thought you'd lost the love of your life. Jane hesitated, her breath catching. Diana looked at her sister, seeing Jane compose herself before she went on. Do not be so inward and isolated with your thoughts and decisions, Miss Schaub. Discuss them. Share them with those you love. What they have to say on the matter might surprise you. I pray you find happiness in the end, Miss Schaub. Your friend Bonadea. Jane closed up the letter and moved to her feet, her face a mixture of anger and sadness. You turned Lord Lexington down because you believe you have to stay here with me. Yes. Diana didn't hesitate in her answer, for there seemed little point now. She sat straight on the stool and reached for Arnold's handkerchief where it rested on her vanity table. I put you first. Then that is madness, Jane said with vigour and strode forward, dropping the letter in front of Diana. As Bonadea says, you should discuss these things with me, so let us discuss these things right now. She took Diana's shoulders urging her to turn and face her. I do not need a guard dog. That's not what I am. Is it not? Jane teased her with a small smile. You have been my carer constantly, and though I may still need guidance, I am not in need of you as a parent, but as a sister. She held her gaze, clearly waiting for these words to sink into Diana. You have grown up much, Diane murmured in realisation. Sometimes I forget to see that. Then let me tell you something else you do not realise. Jane dropped to her knees. Bonadea is right. If you turn down Lord Lexington now because of me, I would never be happy. I will never forgive myself for it. All I want is for you to be happy, sister. For once, put your own heart first instead of mine. But no more buts. Jane shook her head, talking over Diana. Besides, what if I was to come with you to the continent? I would love to see the world. You would? 
Diana asked. But if I took you with me, you would not be here. You would miss the rest of your opening season. What of your own marriage? Oh, I'm in no rush. Jane waved a hand at the idea. I'd enjoy seeing the world. So please, sister, for a minute do not think of me. Do not think of my own marriage and tell me the truth. She sat back on her haunches, waving at Diana. What do you feel for Lord Lexington? Truly? Diana felt her chest tighten at the thought of him. She missed him badly after only a few days of being parted from him. I love him, she whispered. At last, a declaration. Jane leapt to her feet. This I have waited long enough to hear. And you wish to marry him? Diana indulged in the thought. With what Bonadea had written and all that Jane had said, she allowed herself to imagine a life married to Arnold. She thought of waking up beside him, of never having to part from his side, and of exploring the world with him. What a life that could be. I do, Diana murmured, then jumped to her feet. Oh my goodness, I do want to marry him. Then get dressed. Jane reached into the cupboard and pulled out Diana's new blue gown and threw it at her head. Do not delay. We shall ask our uncle's opinion and be on the carriage to Lord Lexington's house before lunch. Jane ran for the door. Hurry, Diana. If he is to leave soon, then we must find him before he goes. Diana felt a dread creeping in. Had she left it too late? Was it possible that Arnold had already left for the continent? She threw on her gown and hastened to do her hair, making such a mess of it that a maid had to come in and redo it for her. I hardly care how it looks. I must see him before I'm too late. Chapter 13 Diana Of course you have my blessing! Lord Cobham's voice boomed as he jumped up from the dining table, tipping over his coffee cup though he made no effort to catch it. Two footmen leapt forward. One caught the coffee cup before it could roll on the floor, and the other mopped up the coffee. Come, come, let us be quick. Lord Cobham beckoned both Diana and Jane to the door. We shall take you to see him at once. You would be happy for the union? Diana asked, as her uncle took her arm and led her through the house. Simpkins! Fetch the carriage at once, if you would. He called ahead, then shifted his focus back to Diana. Of course, dear. Not only is Baron Lexington a fine contact, a respectable man, but I have never seen any other man so well suited for you. Come, let us get on the road at once. As they stepped into the carriage, Diana was jittery. She could not sit still and repeatedly wrung her hands together, perched on the very edge of the coach bench. Jane kept trying to pull her back, but she sat forward again. If this carriage goes much faster, you'll bounce right out of your seat, Jane warned, clutching to the back of the bench as they bounced over potholes. I fear you are right, Lord Cobham said, looking a little pale from the speed of the carriage as his fingers gripped the bottom of the seat. As the carriage came to a sudden stop on the Lexington estate, Diana jumped out of the door, not bothering to wait for the footman to open it for her. Taking the skirt of her gown in one hand, she ran to the door, breathless as she knocked. Please, Arnold, please be here. She rehearsed in her head what she would say, how Jane had helped her to see that she no longer needed to put Jane first. Perhaps both she and Jane could be happy travelling the continent together. I am free to love him. Without restraint and I will not have broken my vow as Jane has released me from it. She planned as well to tell Arnold of Bonadea and the advice she had given. If it wasn't for Bonadea's words, she would not feel this hope and happiness now that made her bounce on her toes with excitement. Miss Sharb! 
The door opened and the butler stared at her. Good day. I'm here to see the Baron, she said, craning her neck to look past the butler. I am afraid he is gone. The butler's words deadened her to the spot. All the fidgeting and bouncing stopped. I beg your pardon, she managed in a small voice. He is to take a ship from Southampton tomorrow to Calais, the butler explained, looking between her and Lord Cobham and Jane, who had just stepped out of the carriage on the drive. He has taken a carriage this morning to Southampton, and shall stay overnight before he leaves. Oh! Diana could manage no other words. She stared listlessly into the house without any real direction, her heart thudding so hard that she was in agony. I am too late, I have missed him. Her mind ran wild with fear. The last time she had seen Arnold, he had said he was not sure when he would be back. What if it was months? It could even be years until she had the chance to see him again. How would her heart bear it? What if he found another in that time and married someone else? Am I doomed to have a wounded heart forevermore? Thank you. Diana remembered her manners and thanked the butler, then stepped off the doorstep, so distracted that she slipped off the last step and nearly fell over. Jane caught her arm, holding her up. I can't believe we are too late, Jane whispered. It is too much. Too much indeed. Lord Cobham stood very still on the driveway, shaking his head. He's a diplomat, you see. Where he is needed, he must go. He shrugged helplessly. Though I suspected he might hold out for you until the last, Diana. When he asked for my blessing, I thought him utterly devoted to his hope and to you. Wait! Diana paused, turning to face her uncle. He asked your blessing? Of course, he smiled. He asked me the last time he came for dinner. You two retired to the parlour, and we stayed in the dining room for coffee. Never have I seen a man so enamoured. He patted Diana softly on the arm. I am truly sorry we're too late. I would say I wish our carriage could ride faster, but I fear I may not have made the journey if it had. He still looked a little queasy and placed a hand to his stomach as it made an audible groan. What now? Jane asked, walking Diana back to the carriage. There was a part of her that felt lost as if it had left already with Arnold and would not return until she found him. With Jane's arm in her own, she walked toward the carriage, her body moving numbly. Miss Shorb, I have something for you. The butler's words called her to a stop. She released Jane's arm and turned back to the door, watching as he retreated inside. As they waited for him, Diana exchanged a look with her sister. Jane looked equally perplexed, shrugging her shoulders. The butler returned and offered a sealed envelope to Diana. He wished this to be sent to you, but I hadn't yet managed to post it today. Thank you. Diana took the letter, finding her name written elegantly on the envelope. She turned her back on her uncle and Jane, wishing to be alone to read what Arnold had to say. Peeling open the envelope, she found a letter inside. My dearest Diana, for dearest is what you have always been and shall be. I understand if your priority for your sister's happiness will always win. I can hardly blame you for such a noble endeavour as to put another's happiness above your own. But if you should ever change your mind, if you should wish to join me on the continent to marry me, I beg of you to do so. I enclose two tickets for passage to France. One is for you and the other for your sister, for I would never wish you to be without her. With all my love, Arnold. He has left us tickets. Diana turned sharply round and held the tickets up in the air, her body jittery with excitement once again. Look, he's asked us to go with him. She offered the letter to Jane, who swooned as she read the words. Lord Cobham took the tickets, examining them. Is there any way we could get to Southampton overnight, in time for the boat tomorrow? There may be. 
Lord Cobham frowned, his expression not revealing much hope. Diana didn't know if he was thinking of his nausea on carriage journeys, or if he believed too much time had passed already. Maybe I am too late. Is that everything, my lord? The quartermaster for the ship took the baggage trunks from his footman. Arnold sighed and glanced back across the dock. Southampton was an industrial place with steam billowing above factories and the dockyard full of ships ready to depart. It was so busy that one lady's head was difficult to discern from another, but he didn't once glimpse Diana's blonde hair. It was foolish of me to hope she would come. You would think after asking her to marry me twice I would have learned to abandon that hope. Yes, that is everything, he said with sadness and handed his ticket to the quartermaster, who nodded and gestured to the ramp connected to the shop. We'll be setting off soon, my lord. Thank you. Arnold stepped up the wooden ramp, digging the heels of his boots into the surface, and walked onto the ship. He breathed in sharply, filling his lungs with the sea air, and turned to face the ocean, rather than the city. He had little wish to look back at England and be reminded of whom he had left behind. He kept his eyes on the blue ocean instead, thinking of the one woman who had been a constant in his life, the sea. She could be merciless, adventurous, and he would have to devote himself to her and that life now. At least it would be some distraction from the heartbreak. My lord, my lord, a woman's voice cried. She could have been calling to any man aboard this ship with a title, and Arnold was not so arrogant as to think a calling woman was after his attention, so he didn't turn round. Resting his elbows on the gunwales, he kept his eyes on the white horses dancing on the sea. Arnold, the cry of his Christian name caught his attention. That voice, it can't be. He tapped his own face, wondering if he was dreaming. Arnold? That voice came again. Diana. He pushed off from the gunwales and crossed the ship, facing the city and the dock once again. Five people were running across the dock, slipping between the groups. Diana was out in front, hurrying fast and clinging to her skirt, with her bonnet missing and her blonde hair wild. Miss Jane ran behind her, holding onto Diana's bonnet. Two footmen ran carrying trunks, and at the back was Lord Cobham, struggling to keep up with the rest, and placing a hand repeatedly to his rounded stomach. Diana. Arnold hurried back onto the ramp, his stomach tense with excitement. He ran down, hopping past people who complained as they tried to get on the ship. You came. Diana reached him quickly. Without any modesty at all, she threw her arms around him in an embrace. So overwhelmed to have her there, he held her back, hardly caring that they weren't wed. He just held on to her, burying his head on her shoulder and feeling her arms come up around his neck. I'm so sorry, truly. I am, she said in a rush, pulling back enough to look him in the eye. I will tell you all. I will explain it. But know this, if you still wish to marry me, she abruptly smiled, that look transforming her features, I'd love to be your wife. You would, he said, stuttering in his amazement. Of course I love you, Arnold, she whispered. I think part of me loved you that day we first met. I was certainly fascinated by you, and since then, oh, how could I not help but love you? Diana. He moved toward her without restraint, rather thankful that her uncle had dropped so far back across the dockyard that he would struggle to see what Arnold did next. He kissed Diana, pressing his lips to hers firmly. She kissed him back, her hands gripping to his shoulders as she angled her head against his. As they parted, they both laughed, smiling broadly. Thank God, he murmured, you received the tickets. I did. Jane and I wish to come with you. Miss Jane appeared at her side, breathless and bending over. Thank God we are not too late, she said between gasping breaths. Shall I get on? Well, I look forward to this adventure. Jane waved her ticket at the quartermaster and sped onto the ship. 
Arnold laughed deeply, stunned at how quickly things had changed. He looked at Diana again, feeling how strong happiness swelled within him. We can marry in Paris, he whispered. I, I cannot wait. My lord! Lord Cobham appeared as the footman passed the trunks into the quartermaster's hands. I give you my blessing again. He shook Arnold's hand. Thank you, my lord, thank you so much. Whatever union is going on here, we do not have time. The quartermaster stepped forward. If you wish to go to France, get on the ship now. We are about to depart. Arnold offered his hand to Diana and led her onto the ship. She called back to her uncle, promising she would write and they would return for visits soon. Lord Cobham waved with vigour and made her promise to write many letters, for he wished to hear of their travels. As they stepped onto the ship and it was prepared to leave, with the vast sails unrolled and shipmates hurrying to their business, Jane walked around the ship asking questions of strangers she met. Arnold stayed by the gunnels, with his arm around Diana's waist, and she held just as tightly onto him. She did not look at the parting city, nor at the waves, but at him. You've made me the happiest of men, he whispered in her ear. We have another to thank for that, she murmured. Jane made me see that I was protecting her, mothering her, when she's quite old enough to make decisions for herself. There's another we must thank too. Now she looked out to the ocean, her hand finding Arnold's as their fingers entwined together. He looked down at her hand, imagining a ring that would soon be on her finger when they were wed. A woman called Bonadea. She wrote to me and encouraged me to see that happiness must be grasped in this world. We should not turn our backs on it out of fear or a wish to do right by others. She has been a good friend to me in her letters. I truly hope she is as happy as I am now. Arnold couldn't resist and bent down toward Diana, kissing her sweetly. Once they were wed, he'd have no need to restrain himself again. She smiled up at him, her hair dancing in the wind. Wait, who exactly is this Bona Dea? Arnold asked, and Diana laughed and revealed all to him. He thought to himself if he ever met Bona Dea, he'd have to thank her for the letters she sent. It was because of her and Jane, that he had everything he had ever dreamed of. I have Diana, the end. Read the lady's spell story now. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.